wait like a little bit there. Um, there's no PA, right? So like, I have to like actually. Can you hear me at the back, sort of? Yeah. Okay. Let me know if it, if, it, if I start mumbling too much. So hey, um, this is the HTTP2 workshop. Just to make sure everyone's in the right place. Okay. So you are? Yeah, I'm Indian. I run a startup here called Exsecure, focused on front-end performance, like anything to do with JavaScript. Cool. Uh, I'm Sebastian Deckers. I'm uh, sort of just open source guy for the last year. HTTP2 has sort of been my side project, weekend hack, hack project thing, and then sort of it's been going completely dominating my life for the last year and a half. Um, I've been working on this for a long time now, and I'd like to share some of what, I, what I've uh, learned along the way and built along the way. So uh, I'm, I want to start with like a little introduction on HTTP2, but before we do that, like. Who here is actually using HTTP2 um, or knows sort of a little, little bit about it already? Okay, that's like if there's, okay, fantastic. Who is shy of raising their hands? Okay, everyone, right? So, excellent. So, like, uh, I am just going to touch like sort of lightly on HTTP2 because the protocol itself is actually really similar to HTTP1, which I mean, we've, okay, we're all web developers here, I, I think. I don't want to make too many assumptions. So, like, if you're like coming in here from a Haskell functional programming background and you've never seen the web, then let me know. Um, but I'll assume like certain things about like your knowledge of HTTP that you understand what a request and a response are. That you've ever built a web app that serves a response to a request, right? Um, but what's different in HTTP two is uh, some of these basic things that I'll just go through now. So, the, the, the first concept that is really interesting is you have streams instead of just sockets. So HTTP 1, everything is over, goes over one socket, right? That means um, a TCP level socket. So TCP, you have this uh, socket provided, and your HTTP goes on top of that. With uh, every single request, you need to have a socket, and then you can send one request, uh, wait for a response, send another request, wait for another response. Uh, introduces certain things like uh, head of line blocking, which is essentially when um, you have a request that's gone out, and it's like a really huge response that you're waiting for. You, any other request in the meantime, wait for you know, the, 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 uh, the original response to finish before they can go out over that same socket. Uh, HP1, you address that with things like opening you know, six or eight sockets. Uh, all right, are you, are you joining for HTTP2? Yeah. All right, just uh, set yourselves down somewhere. We've already started, but you know, just the beginning. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, come. Yeah, yeah, fine. No, it's <clears> hurting. <throat> oh, that's my back again. This is back. Okay, so I've, uh, for the newcomers as well, uh, I've, I'm just explaining some of the very basic uh, theory. It's a little dry, it's a little bit conceptual, but we'll get into code very quickly. And then you get more of a, an intuitive feeling once you start coding and actually using these concepts. So I was just talking about streams. So basically, you can th consider a HTTP 1 has a socket where you have to like, wait for a response and a request to finish before you do the next one. With streams, the, the idea is that um, you have one socket, and then over that, you have, over, over that socket, instead of sending out your request right away, you can chunk it up into little, little packets called frames. And these frames can ha have a, this identifier, this stream identifier, this ID, that basically lets you send the various stream IDs, like various headers and various data fragments um, on the same you know, like TCP socket. So you can have multiple requests going out at the same time, and then some of the responses start trickling back uh, data frames. Uh, and sort of by doing this all over one socket, you gain some, some benefit in this head of line blocking. You no longer have to like, wait for the response to finish. Um, but that, that was sort of the, the design of HTTP2. In practice, it turns out that you, ba you basically just push the head of line blocking down another level. So most tutorials that you'll read out there are going to be like, oh my god, we solved, HTTP2 solves head of line blocking. It doesn't actually in practice because you just sort of push it down one level. Which is why, in the last few years, people have been working on this new spec called Quick. Um, Quick is basically dropping TCP altogether and just putting everything directly over UDP and implementing sort of the similarities of what, like what TCP offers. This whole 
kind of retransmission, control flow, uh, implementing that in its own spec on top of, uh, like within UDP. And we'll talk a bit more about that later and what that brings, but the focus will be on HTTP2. And you can, you can sort of as assume that Quick is sort of like a uh, uh, supplemental to, to HTTP2. It's not fundamentally changing the concepts of what we're talking about here. So we've just covered a little bit of streams. Uh, frames, like I said, you kind of chop up your data into frames, right? So I'm not going to go into like too much details right now. We'll see more later when we actually start using these things. Uh, it also offers header compression. It's called HPAC. There's actually a couple of um, proposals right now to, to change HPAC to newer, uh, newer uh, compression schemes. There may or may not be some uh, security vulnerabilities. There's also some, some things that it doesn't offer, uh, like right now. Um, it, like for instance, if you compress, uh, if you have streams that all go to the same um, domain name, the same authority or, or, or host or origin, whatever you call it, uh, the terminology sort of blurs a bit over the different versions of HTTP. But if you if you send um, headers to like example.com, and then you would send it to example.net, those headers are compressed with a separate dictionary, so you don't you don't have the full efficiency. So this is something that people want to fix now. By hmm, scusi. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little line. It doesn't really matter. By the way, you can just access this yourself if you want to like skip ahead if you get bored or anything. I'm not going to hold you back. Uh, can you see this URL? It's, um, hang on. Oh. Damn it. Something like that. So yeah, feel free to skip around. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to hold you back, OK? So like I was saying, uh, HPAC, people are trying to fix that as well. So you know, just because I'm, I mention these things now doesn't mean that they'll be the same in like a couple of years. Uh, little parts of the protocol are actually already evolving. And we'll, we'll, we'll even try using some of the newer uh, extensions that have been uh, adopted for HTTP2, and even some of the experimental ones, which is kind of cool. OK, you got it? Get it from your neighbor. So we also have priorities and dependencies. This is a new concept. In HTTP 1, there's no such thing. But now you've got a concept of uh, streams that can be depend on another stream because they're all on, on the same socket. You, the server could now determine uh, which one should be prioritized. So, so if you have, let's say, your, your, an image right, that's maybe not, not as uh, high up on the page, you can give it a lower priority. And the server can interpret that as a suggestion from the client or as a hint to say, OK, I'm going to send you everything else uh, with a higher pri priority. I'm going to allocate more bandwidth on this socket to the, you know, the higher priority uh, resources. Um, I will say that in practice, like this is a, this is a sort of a concept in the spec. In practice, it doesn't really work. OK, so <laughs> um, different servers uh, implement this differently. Um, most sort of really just ignore it. Um, browsers also have very differing uh, opinions about how to create this dependency tree, some of which are really just a queue. So you have a tree where like, you have one branch, and then another branch, and another branch. It doesn't really help. OK, so it, this is something that people are playing with. But it's really, unless you're doing the research specifically on that area, and you're trying to optimize something, it's not really going to be a very huge impact. But it's a lot of complexity for you implementing it. So yeah, great choice, uh, spec designers. So yeah, we've got another thing. Clients and servers can negotiate settings. When a client connects, it has a certain amount of settings that it sends in as, as, as like the first one of the first frames uh, to the server, and the server will resp respond back with its own settings. <coughs> so settings can be things like uh, um, saying like, okay, how many how many streams can I have open at maximum at any given time? Now the default in the spec recommends to never go below a hundred. Uh, Chrome actually says like a thousand streams. You know, so this is like a thousand requests and responses could be open at the same at the same time. On uh, on a single socket, like that's pretty liberal. Like that's pretty, you know, generous. Um, other things are uh, like receive windows and things like that. So like, uh, wait, hang on, are we not, don't we have don't we have enough chairs? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Right now, there's like space to sit in the front if you want to get closer. Can you hear me? Okay, there. Okay. So yeah, a um, little bit of setting negotiation. We'll, we'll try to use some of those. 
Uh, for instance, one of, the, one of the key ones is the client can also enable or disable uh, server push, which is uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to mention. Is, and that was my uh, personal, the, the thing that got me into HTTP2 a couple of years ago, uh, speedy back then, was server push, because I really liked the idea that the server can just eliminate any wasted round trips by saying to the client, here's some file that I'll also send you in response to your request. So let's say a, a browser visits a website, requests you know, example.com slash, you know, just like the index HTML. The server would normally serve that, take some time to get to the client, client processes, parses this thing, and then goes and says, okay, now I need my you know, app.js, and I need my styles, my design.css, and whatever. So there's a lot of that round trip time that is typically wasted. It's called think time in, in some contexts. Um, and with push, you could actually eliminate that. When, with push, if the server knew what the client would need uh, to go along with that page, it could push along those assets right away. And so that's a really cool idea, I thought. And so I've, this is what I've been working towards, and we'll, 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 we'll use this later. And I'll, sh I'll talk about some of the, actually, like some of the problems with that, what wasn't maybe foreseen, and how we can address those then. So we'll go pretty deep on that. Um, and then lastly, here's um, the coalescing connection kind of idea, um, <coughs> which, which fits into the whole streams. So with streams, you basically have, like, like, let's say all the JavaScript files, all the image files, all the CSS files from your website can go onto uh, the same TCP socket at the same time. But now, let's say that you're on a CDN, um, a CDN is like a, a, a service that, like, uh, like Cloudflare, you might have heard of, or Fastly, or Ak Akamai, um, and many other large companies offer CDN services. Like, um, so what happens is that a lot of people put their website onto those services to host them from servers around the world. Because when you put servers around the world, you get, those servers get closer, these edge servers get closer to large population centers of the, of the world, and that eliminates the latency, and which is always, the, having low latency is the, uh, best solution to any performance issue, basically, on, on the web. Um, if you have really low latency, if you're like in Singapore and you're requesting from a data center in, in One North, um, you, you're never, never going to notice that you're doing 100 round trips, because you can do it in like a tenth of a second, right? It's <laughs> cool. Is it, is it hackling, or what? It, no. <laughs> uh, OK, so, so anyway, anyway with, um, once, you, uh, once you're on the CDN for all these various performance reasons, there's, a, there's this concept of coalescing connections where you could say, I'm going to establish connection to my site, my example.com domain, but then I need to connect, I need to like mm, load something from api.example.com, like because I have a single page app that's talking to an API. And what's happening now is that you can put the, both of those domains onto a CDN that serves a single certificate with like maybe like a TLS certificate uh, to, to secure the connection, which lists b um, both of these domain names. And then the client is able to connect uh, to, to, to request from both of those origins on the same connection. So you eliminate the, entire, the need to set up another connection, which is actually a rather expensive uh, process in terms of latency, because uh, to set up a socket takes like, two, like a, a round trip. To do then TLS is like another two round trips at least. And before you can then do your HTTP request, right? that's four, four round trips at least, um, possibly more, because the size of the certificate might you know, incre increase the amount of bandwidth that exceeds a, a single round trip. Um, so the idea is that you can serve multiple domains on the same, uh, on, on, on the same uh, like TCP socket, the same connection, right? And if you combine all these things together, we can start m moving towards a very different way of delivering web, web applications, where you have zero latency, like, or you have the minimal theoretical amount of latency between your client and your server. You, you have zero th wasted think time, because you're constantly, the, your server is constantly pushing data down that pipe. Uh, to fill the maximum cap cap uh, capability. This is very important in, uh, when, in places where there isn't uh, an abundance of uh, CDN infrastructure available right now. Um, so this, this allows you to serve like from Singapore, let's say, to, to a customer in, in, in America or, or, or in South Africa uh, without having necessarily like setting up servers all, uh, in all these places. Um, so there's, there's a lot of concepts there. And I, I'll, I'll talk about like sort of how I've been experimenting with those and actually uh, using them in practice and what tools we can use to, 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 to do this. And we'll start with some very, uh, we'll start with taking just a closer look at these, uh, these, pr these protocols, the data that's actually being sent. So we, we get familiar more with, the, uh, with the, the sort of the primitives of the protocol. Um, I will point out that my little rant here is probably not the best explanation. 
Um, what is probably the best explanation is this really rather excellent FAQ written by, um, I think, Mark Nottingham, who's uh, one, of, one of the authors of the, uh, I think he's one of the chairs of the ITF HTTP working group. Uh, so he's been, he's been doing this for decades. He's really, really good at it. And he writes rather nicely. So you should actually go through this. Um, I, I think that out of all the tutorials that I've ever seen about HTTP2, um, none are as good as the actual spec. It's a very easy to read spec. It takes like maybe an hour. And if you're intent on working with this, I would highly recommend just sit down and go through it. Take your time. And as you're working with it, also just like look at the spec as your source of truth rather than uh, looking at like blog posts and tutorials and, and talks like this. These, like, I'm just trying to facilitate like, and explain what I've learned, but I'm not like better than the spec. Okay, So look at these things. And um, I found it rather really uh, sort of en enlightening. So right, there's the, the actual, that, so that was the FAQ. So this is under um, the HTTP, um, the HTTP working group. The IETF is this thing in the top right here. It's, uh, okay, come on, position static. So the IETF thing here, that's a standards body that um, is really an open organization. Anyone can participate in these discussions. They mostly take place on mailing lists. These are people from around the world with, who work for all kinds of uh, companies that are competitors of each other most of the time. Browser vendors and, like I said, CDNs and uh, open source you know, hackers. Um, and they have various working groups for different protocols. So most of the protocols that I've mentioned so far, like, like TCP and UDP and, and Quick and uh, TLS and uh, DNS and HTTP, they're all standards set up uh, as, by working groups. The WG is a working group that fall under the ITF organization. And they sort of have a lot of process around it to make sure that this is facilitated fairly openly and anyone can participate in this. In fact, just last month, I think, two months ago, last month, they had the 100th uh, meeting in person um, and it happened in Singapore. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to attend it for my first time and it was the best uh, tech conference I've ever been to. Because it wasn't really like a tech conference like this where you go to attend workshops. It was just people discussing this spec. Like people actually like would get up and propose something and people would like then debate these, these, these concepts. It was very, very, um, very, very nice, to, very enjoyable. I, and I was sort of attending uh, and I, I was able to contribute as well. Even though I don't work for a Google or a Mozilla or whoever that was there, uh, I can just go as an independent person and say, okay, I've worked on the node with it. But like everyone just speaks for themselves. Nobody speaks for their employer, for instance. So everyone is on an on a equal, equal footing and can fairly contribute their feedback and ideas. So if you're interested in that at all, um, take a look at the mailing lists uh, under the uh, HTTP working group. So you'll find all of that here at the httpwg.org. <coughs> and over here is the mailing list. This is where all of the discussion happens. So personally, I don't discuss a lot there, but I do lurk. So that's a good way to sort of keep, keep, stay abreast of what's coming up. And you'll see things that might not even exist for another two or three years in browsers and such. But you'll just be aware of it. You'll see what's coming. So this, I think this is very valuable for any web developer to sort of keep, you know, keep up to date and stay ahead of what's up to date right now. Um, so this is like, I mean, you see some really interesting discussions happening, and it's kind of cool to see like the names coming back and who's this, who's working on it. You'll start seeing like who's which browser may or may not be implementing which features and all that. Um, so anyway, take a look at those. So then, um, first thing we can do is a couple of tools to look at HTTP2 traffic. Uh, I was going to suggest that you first open up like Chrome, like your inspector. You have Chrome installed. Most of you hope so. Okay, so. All right, so let's go to a website. Let's see, JSConf. Oh, hang on. Who's, who, who here knows that uh, on Sunday there's a meetup called CopyJS? Yeah? All right, so actually, as an aside, um, if you're around on Sunday, I don't know, for the visitors, it might be a little bit difficult, but if you're around at all on Sunday morning, there's a, um, uh, a meetup called CopyJS where people just gather. It's not really 100% JavaScript, but there's be, be mostly like developers there. But you don't need to actually talk about coding or anything like that. It's just a nice way to socialize and you know meet some people over a cup of uh, local Singapore coffee. So uh, check it out. Anyway, point is we have this website open. We have our inspector. Go to network tab, reload. All right, here we go. So this is happening over protocol H two. 
Okay, so that's our that's our basically our first clue of that this is not like a standard old HTTP one website. Now the next thing you do is you go to Chrome slash net internals. That's a little lower level debugging in the browser. And if you go to HTTP two on the left hand side there, is this too small for the people at the back? Can you sort of see it? Is it too small or? Okay, okay. Mia cool. Better? So I'm not sure if you can see the URL, so let me just magnify that separate. What's that short key on Mac to like? No, as in like to, to sort of zoom the screen? What's it called? I always forget that. Command plus, I think. Yeah, that's, that zooms the content, but not the, like the, the browser bar. No, I think it's like with a pinch gesture and then some keys or whatever. It would be useful. Yeah, I could do the pasting, but then I have to do it like every single time. Mm. Whoa. You can just zoom parts of it like that. Or the, you can enable trackpad. And if, and if, how does that work? Option command? No. No? I I Option command 9. Zero. Okay, what was that? What was it in Arabic? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, now we've got like our little uh, live overview of what's going on here um, in, in in the internals of the browser, and we can see our session here, our live sessions. So Copy.js on port four four three, which is standard for TLS, for like a HTTPS URL, it's got this session here ID three hundred and eighty five, and probably we have to like reload this page. Then we see it captured something. So Come on. Stop. Stop capture. OK. OK, it's quite annoying. OK. OK. Anyway, I'll do it like that. So on your computer, you probably have to, don't have to struggle with the zooming thing and all that. But basically, you can see like really low level information on what actually happened, how the browser uh, requested it. Um, we start seeing some some general events, so you see here like it. Uh, well, that was like because we reloaded it. It first closed it. Um, had probably received some settings there. Clearing this thing out. Where do we open it again? Hmm. One second. Hey. Okay. Hang on. These these tools are a little bit finicky, so bear with me, please. Why is it not? Okay. Live demos are the best. Oh, here we go. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got like a little idea of, of what's going on here. So our session, this is the request the way it goes out. Um, because it's all binary, it's basically, this is a decoded view of that binary. Like, if, it, if you were looking at the actual binary and just like rendering it as ASCII, you would just get a bunch of garbage. Um, because everything's compressed, like I said. So it's compression kind of like makes it very efficient, but also totally not human readable anymore, right? So this is decoded, this is uncompressed, and then a representation. So this is just a debugger panel. This is not literally the bytes that are going out. With HTTP 1, the bytes that go out are pretty much literally <laughs> like this, just that they get wrapped inside TLS. Um, here, the, a lot of this looks very familiar, but you can already see some differences. You have these uh, pseudo headers. In, in, um, in HTTP 1, it would look different. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but in HTTP 1, that would look uh, the first line of the request is basically just get and then the protocol uh, name and version and then the uh, path, right? In uh, HTTP 2, because there's no like text-based line-by-line protocol, these get encoded as headers so that they can also be compressed. And so they're prefixed with this colon so that they never clash. So if you see any, any headers that do not start with colon, then these are the sort of regular headers. The ones that start with colon are defined by the RFC and are sort of reserved pseudo headers. And um, these get compressed really efficiently, so they don't take as much bandwidth as actually what you see on the screen. Also, if you have repetitive ones, they completely sort of encode it to their entropy, entropy values. 
So you see a lot of these um, sessions, like this, this, this single session has a lot of streams going over it. Uh, we can start seeing things like um, uh, the parent stream ID for this one is zero, that's the root is zero. The, then the, they sort of incrementally uh, go up the, in, in terms of the, the stream ID. So there's, there's this difference between even and odd numbers of stream IDs, depending on whether it's like initiated by the client or, from, or by the server, like which direction it's going, so you can kind of tell. Uh, they can go up to like uh, 31 bits, so it's like a billion streams either direction. So uh, you should never be exhausting that, actually. Now, basically, this is one way of looking at the, uh, the debugging thing. What, what I wanted to actually do is uh, install some of these tools. Um, who's got curl on their system? Probably everyone. Who, who, who has used curl before? OK, cool, cool. So just try to run, like, for those who have not, and uh, for those who have not yet seen HTTP2 being inspected with curl, just run curl. Oh, ugh. okay, just run curl dash dash verbose, and then the uh, the URL HTTPS coolpjs.org. So you'll see all this uh, content, right? But all the way at the top, you see the interesting part. Curl actually gives you kind of an insight into how it sets up the connection with TLS. And um, what's being sent uh, with the headers? Um, so at the, at the at the top you see things like uh, this ALPN or Alpine. Uh, that's like how it's negotiating whether the server is actually HTTP 1.1 or HTTP 2. Uh, that's part of TLS. So you see things like uh, the, the exact handshake and the certificate exchange. So these are a lot of round trips that are going on. So in in future versions of the protocol. This is one of the things that we're trying to eliminate, these kind of round trips. Uh, you'll see things like which kind of, wh what kind of certificate is it, what algorithms is it using to, to sign and digest and everything. Um, you see some details of the actual certificate. So in, in this case, for instance, the CN, it stands for common name, is copyjs.org. So this certificate is, is only has copyjs on it. So when we're talking about coalescing connections, you need to have like multiple domains on the same certificate. This certificate would not be able to do that. Um, so it's also signed by Let's Encrypt, which is like a, a very common way now. Most, of, most certificates are now signed by Let's Encrypt. It's a free service um, that is available on most uh, hosting companies uh, free of charge. And you can also integrate this yourself. Then, um, okay, then we just see the regular headers. So this is fairly standard HTTP stuff where you see the method. So the, the reason it doesn't show this as actually, like, like this is not actually what was sent out. This is a little bit of a lie by curl. So the, ac the actual thing that gets sent out is those compressed headers, which have a pseudo header, that colon uh, method, colon uh, path. And this is just curl's representation, because curl is kind of a, like a tool that's been around for ages. And I'm guessing inter for the user interface, this was a simple way to make it familiar to everyone else. Um, so, But this is not 100% accurate. But uh, it gives you a good idea of what's going on. Okay, and then another tool that I wanted to share, which is uh, specifically built for HTTP2, is ng-HTTP. Uh, so this one you probably have to, oh, hang on, ng-HTTP2.org. So if you go to this website here, ng-HTTP2.org, um, this is an open source library that implements HTTP2. It's uh, written in C. It's the, it's the underlying library for tools like curl. It's also what's used in like a, a Safari browser, uh, the Apache web server uses it, and Node.js also uses this. Um, and it comes with its own command line. Uh, various tools are included. One is a client that we can now use, the, the command. Uh, when, you, when you install this on your system, you should actually try this now. This is, okay. We're going to be using this. Or you, it's a good time to set it Oh, you, you, can do your, you can do it. OK, so Indian will uh, walk you through how to get this working on your computer. You need this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's cool. It's a Docker thing, huh? Yeah. Who's got Docker on their system? OK, oh, cool. Nice. nice. Wow. If you don't have Docker, please install. Uh, Not the first 
It didn't even recognize the USB. Let me try into the other one. It's fine. I just do it in this. Yeah. What do you think? This is. I think your computer needs this to work. It needs to be. What happened? I don't know. Even yours is not working. Doesn't work. Let's try yours then. Hey. I think it might be easier to install it with Homebrew if someone has that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. Okay. Okay. So we. We'll, yeah. Would your Would your thing work with that? I'm. Yeah, it should. I guess. I think two things are like that. Whoa. Mm. Yeah, it's not even charging our. So we can, like, a uh, great suggestion there. Uh, we can use Homebrew to install this on our own machines. That's actually what I do as well. Uh, the demo was going to be a little bit uh, more of a load testing thing if we can get that working. But that's fine. So if you have a Mac and if you are able to install it via Brew, just do that. Yeah, if you have Mac. Uh, this the Docker was mainly for uh, those who don't have Unix or Mac. With uh, I'm not, I haven't tried it on Windows yet, so. Uh, the Docker content is mainly for that. But if you are able to install NGHTP2, just follow the instructions on the website. I didn't know it was on Brew, but if it's there, just. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for local, local development. Actually, what, uh, so one thing we could do is show, show the demo um, for the load testing. Okay, okay, yeah. Using. Okay. And one quick intermission. Uh, I told the venue that we're going to make it a bit warmer. And second, I would like to have a photo of all of you with Indian and Seth for my collection. Everybody all right? Just okay. I'm not sure I can get everybody in here. Yeah. So you have to be representative with the corners. <laughs> Thank you so much. Or do we do another one with hands? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Love it. Enjoy. Awesome. Okay. It's like next level Instagram. So, um, so yeah, set up NGHTP2 if you have already. And uh, it, so NGHTP2 is a C library which implements a lot of the uh, lower level connection stuff with respect to page. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any anyone able to install it so far? Who's installed it already? Okay. So for eighty percent, so uh, in case you are not able to install it yourself, just I have a Docker container with everything set up. So you can just go to this IP. Oh, sorry, that's the local host IP. Just a second. <laughs> yeah, should be able to access this. Uh, this has uh, the stuff set up so that if you are unable to install, finding some problems installing, this should help you get started. This is quite big though, it's a nearly 800 MB, so yeah, just see if you're in. If you have problems installing, just let me know. Yeah. Can I just use this Alpine image? 
Oh, or is there something else additional that you install? Wait, 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 wait. I do something extra, but this should get yeah, started. Start. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually good. Let me. Yeah, because I already get that up. Okay, okay, that's good enough. Oh, yeah, okay, good point. So if you want to access this URL, make sure you are on the JSConf Wi-Fi network. There are two networks. Your yeah, password is, uh, what is the password? Beware of the cats, I think. Beware of the cats is the password. What? Let me check. Is anyone else able to access this URL? No? You can access it. Which Wi Fi network are you on? Which one are you on? Unless someone else is mimicking that Wi-Fi network. <laughs> you have a yeah, yeah, sir. VPN or something or firewall. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, then uh, you are on a Mac right? Yeah. So this. I have Docker also. Do you have Brew? Yeah. Go install NTH. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this should do. Uh, GitHub or project name because I Oh, that's it's GitLab. This one? GitLab. G A T L A B. It should be. Uh, let me. Because this one works so obvious to Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know the exact URL. Uh, mm. Hopefully, there's no more Sebastians. I think it's a uh, private. Really? No, 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 I was able to access it today morning. Oh, is it? I also cannot access this. <laughs> wow, the net is. Dude, you're definitely on some VPN or something. <laughs> I don't think. Because. Might be somewhere. Something is downloading, right? That's why it's so slow. What is this? We are. This? Oh, oh, oh. We are downloading NG21, right? This one. No, it's. It's still. <laughs> I think it's just too slow. You probably need to. It's 100 kbps. It's not that. But yeah, wait for this is the main thing for you to get installed. So. Anyone else has problem installing the nghtp2 library? Can follow the installation instructions if the binary is taking too long to download. Okay.
So this is basically a C++ library which is provides a lot of the low level abstractions for managing the actual frames that get sent over the HTTP2 connection. So different servers build on top of this, like for example Node.js core is, uses this library to manage some of the different APIs that they are building for the core. So yeah, uh, this also comes with a tool called h2load, which we'll be using to say load test uh, HTTP1 and HTTP2 connections. Uh, that's what I had set up in the Docker image, but I think it might take too long to uh, demo. So, uh, one of the things that I'll be showing is how how that some there are some different ways in which HTTP one and HTTP two are different. So, one of the things in is where HTTP two everything goes on the same connection and different requests happen on different streams, as uh, Seb just mentioned. So, th uh, with HTTP one, for each request, you need to open a different socket, and uh, because of this, there are some security implications of that as well. So. In, for example, if you want to do rate limiting on HTTP 1, right, you might set something like, okay, I don't want more than, say, 1,000 connections open at the same time on the server. But with HTTP 2, you, that's, that paradigm changes because you can, with one connection, you can have, say, 1,000 streams at the same time, which can cost, uh, which can utilize a lot of resources on your server. So when you're shifting to HTTP 2, especially if you're doing that on your own server, not just, like, using a CDN to manage your assets and stuff you need to be uh, fine you need to fine tune all these settings on your server for example nginx has a lot of different directives to manage number of parallel open sessions and stuff like that so the thing i wanted to show here is like how with a uh, minimum amount of resources an attacker can uh, generate a lot of traffic with the say, with, with http2 versus http1 so with http2 it's pretty cheap to start up sort of start make a request you just start a new stream and uh, make a request with that stream with http uh, one it's different so what i'm doing here is basically i'm just starting a docker container with i'm just limiting the amount of memory and cpu it's able to use so yeah so if you if you look at it, I have uh, done the same thing. I've just uh, installed ND, ng HTTP2. It also comes with a library called h2 load. You can look at the different parameters. Thing. Yeah. So you can use different parameters to uh, load test your application. The cool thing about this is it allows you to send requests both via HTTP1 and HTTP2. So using this, you can test uh, which one works better, not works better, which one can send more uh, requests at the same time. So yeah, one of the things you can play around with is number of requests that you, total number of requests that you want to send, and this is sends it in batches. So you can say that, okay, send 100 requests at the same time, I want you to send a total of 10,000 requests. And number of threads you want to use, I'm just going, going to use one because I just have one core. Uh, I have limited uh, Docker access to just one core. Number of concurrent streams, this is only uh, useful in HTTP2. You can also force HTTP1, so let me just. Uh, so, so, um, so I'm just trying to send a lot of traffic to a server, make sure that uh, you can, I have set up a sample server here, don't, probably don't bring down the copy.js website, but. <laughs> This is a test server. I don't care if it goes down. So it's just experiment.dexsecure.com. The thing is, this server is also running on a Docker image with very little resources. So there's a high chance that it can go down. Uh, of course, I am not redirecting to HTTPS, but yeah. OK. So So this is what I'm saying. I'm saying like send 10,000 requests, 100,000 requests. I'll probably reduce that. Don't want to say. Um, yeah, let me see what this does. OK. So yeah, it, it's able to send that quite quickly. So using uh, the, it chose HTTP2 because we are, by default it chooses HTTP2. You can see the throughput here. 
and you can also play around with the number of connections. So within one connection, it has multiple streams. I'm starting six connections to see if that improves throughput. It depends on your uh, system configuration and stuff like that. With HTTP 1, the throughput is much more lower. So you can force HTTP 1 by sending this uh, flag called H1. So here, if, if you try to start a lot of connections at the same time, the Docker image just crashes. Like it, uh, I mean, the, it's not able to send as many re parallel requests as HTTP2. And uh, you can play around with that. So you can see if you start se setting C, the, that is the number of open connections to say 15 or 20, it won't be able to handle it. So And you can see that it's much more slower. You can measure the throughput. Yeah, just play around with this tool. It's good for measuring, seeing what, uh, how HTTP 1 and 2 are different fun at a fundamental level, why using streams is different from setting up a whole new connection to it's more memory efficient and stuff like that. So you can just play around with this. Does, has anyone has problem setting up ng-http dot trying out h2 load? Just let me know. can see the request start failing as I open 100 parallel connections, which is very bad with HTTP 1. So you can see that most requests just fail because it's not able to open that many parallel connections. But with HTTP 2, this is much more easier to do. So the URL is GitLab, not GitHub. So uh, if you want to access the readme, uh, this is the URL. Can I access it, right? Yeah. Now are you able to access it? Uh, this one, right? That one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is the one. Okay. And how to use this one? So, th have you installed? Yeah. So, just uh, think there's. So, there now there will be a tool called H2 Load. I think. Yeah. So, now you just give it a URL and it'll start. And you need to can set the number of total requests to send, how many requests to send in parallel and stuff like that. And just monitor your CPU usage and the throughput. The Mateo's talk this morning, the workshop about performance. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was really involved in the HTTP2 implementation uh, last year. Of uh, uh, basically, like there was a there was a person from his company called uh, James Snell, 
who's a, also like a really amazing node hacker um, who worked on it primarily, and Matteo was supporting him in that. Uh, and I contributed a little bit on some some of the compatibility layer and server push support and some testing and stuff like that. But um, Matteo made, made this other tool called H2 URL. I don't know if you call it hurl or what, but uh, you should ask him, I guess. Um, but if you npm install h2 URL, it gives you another option, another tool that you can use to uh, do similar things to curl or hhtp2. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's another option, just npm install this uh, locally in your package or, or do a global install. I, I mean, you everyone here understands npm works. So this is something might, some, some people might, might have not yet seen is you can also ngx h2 URL. And that's basically like npm, a tool that comes with npm, so if you have node installed on your system, you need node 9.4 for this stuff, by the way, all the H2 stuff, just stay with the latest one, it's changing like every week. Um, so if you do npx instead of npm, you can just do npx h2 URL and run the entire command. What happens is that npx is, is like a little helper helper tool that, in, that npm installs it in like a temporary location, runs the command, and when it finishes running, it removes it immediately again. So it's kind of like the benefit of doing a global install without actually polluting, you know, your your, your command line uh, namespace. So try try npx h2 url dash dash verbose and some url. Try that out. It's a, it's a nice tool. It's a it's just a little experimental thing. It's a yeah. Just wanted to say. Each of these can give you a slightly different perspective. Like I was saying earlier also, like curl actually kind of like omits a few things about the protocol, but then it tells you a lot more about the TLS handshake. So depending on what you're debugging, each of these might give you a different insight and might help you solve uh, different problems. Okay. Uh, I, I know for a fact that like the, the browser tools sometimes are fictitious, <laughs> I, I have to put it mildly. Um, like when you're doing things like server push and then you're trying to figure out why are there more requests hitting your server when the browser tells you that it isn't? You know, it can, you can lead to interesting things by looking at the internals and seeing, oh, for some reason it opens up two streams because some bug in a browser leads to, you know, the, the, fa the, the favicon and the favicon being somehow on a separate thread because that's being rendered by a different part of a user interface and it opens up a new TCP token. So all these kind of weird stuff happens and that's why it's useful to have like the full uh, suite of uh, debugging tools. At your disposal. Okay. Um, all right. So everyone's got like a little bit of thing working now. Somebody, everyone's made a request and then looked at the HTTP two stuff. Who still like need, need a little hand? We can go around it. Just make sure. Issue, is it? Let me check. Let me check. Okay. I think there's some issue with this version. Uh, no, uh, this is basically. <laughs> Which version of Node are you in? Hmm. I think it's not understanding the async function. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, no. Not high. I need to. <laughs> this is like to ages the, old. Yeah, okay. Just change to 9.4. Okay. Yeah. Let me upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this definitely won't work with it. By the way, make sure you are at least on nine, eight or nine. Yeah. Node? Node. Yeah. Node. Yeah. Someone here had a Docker issue. Yeah. Here. How do I get there? Docker from where? I have a Docker up and running. I'm using it every day. 
uh, in the <laughs> development. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. But uh, I tried to download the Docker image uh, and then build it, like it says on like, your page. Uh, and then it fails. Uh, Wait, I don't think it should be a minus Docker. From here. Let's find something else. What do you want to build the image? It's actually there, right? So I took a git clone and uh, then I run the Did anyone run like H2 load against the copy chest or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, nice. Yeah, sorry, like, forgive the, the issue. I'll check it out. What it, like, it's, it's basically, it's a server that's just running at home. Oh, uh, uh, not uh, pulling so from the game, pulling complete. Kind of little setup. Because uh, I think I this should work. Are you on Windows 7? Mm, yeah. Okay, uh, try it on the <coughs> terminal with uh, the Linux terminal. Do you have that? Uh, or do you have a git bash or something? I have a bash somewhere. Yeah, yeah, but just try it on bash, yeah, that's what I meant. Because I think it's failing because he didn't expect. Yeah, git bash should work, I think. Oh, but is Docker and stuff installed on git bash? Just I'm using all, uh, Docker every day in the in this uh, Windows. So oh, Windows. Okay. Oh, I'm not sure then. So okay. it should work. It should work. Mm. Just have to run. Uh, no, like it's, uh, he's running a bash script in the installation process, bin sh, and it should work. oh, but this is bash as well. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. All the bash commands. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm not really sure. In VirtualBox, do you have Linux running or something? Yes. Uh, no, it's not in VirtualBox, but I can run everything from here. So. Okay. Let's see. I haven't tried it in Windows, sorry. <laughs> Everything okay? I'm gonna go on to the next part where we get more into the Node.js part side of it. That's cool. Yes, go ahead. Definitely on 9.4.0 for this because I think the APIs have changed again for the push stream. Yeah, so, so, so the main thing is that HTTP 2 is experimental in Node.js. When you, when you start using it, it'll throw a warning. Um, that's fine. That's supposed to be the case. The reason it's there, the reason it's considered experimental, is because the API does still change a little bit here and there. Um, and normally, if you change any API in Node Core, 
even even if it's the smallest thing, like like you change a typo in an error message, right? That has to go through a really lengthy deprecation cycle. That could take years and years because of you know, LTS, the long-term uh, stability, uh, long-term support uh, versions of Node. That could take years to actually fully go out. And just waiting that long with HTTP2 is just not acceptable right now. We we, we didn't want to wait like years to to actually ship it in uh, the sti in the in the um, current version of Node. And we also didn't want to have to leave bugs trailing and trailing for years, potentially leaving people vulnerable to security issues. So that's why HTTP2 is just considered experimental. So if you're using it, uh, expect that some of these APIs might change. So some of the frameworks that you're using, the authors of those frameworks um, have to like really pay attention to this and constantly update. So if you have a dependency on like a, a web service or some, some, some middleware that uses HTTP2, you, you, know, you might want to be updating that all the time. Uh, whenever there's a new version of Node, test it out before you ship it in production. So uh, the current latest release is 9.4.0 as of yesterday. Um, that's what I'll be using. So the, the basic API, the way that you use it is really familiar. Uh, we've got require HTTP for HTTP 1.1. Then if you want to make that secure, you use TLS by requiring HTTPS. That is almost the exact same API. Um, if anyone's read the documentations on HTTP, it's basically you get, you get a function called create server, and with HTTPS you get a function called create secure server, right? Now, if you do require HTTP2, HTTP2 itself doesn't mandate TLS, so you can use it with or without. It's a new protocol, but you can use it with or without TLS. So you get both the create server as well as create ser secure server functions. So with HTTP2, you can skip this difference here, and just you can choose yourself whether you want TLS or not. Now. You probably want TLS, and I'll, I'll probably go into that in a little second here. But for now, let's let's try to build a server using um, just a documentation. So I want to do a little exercise, which is to create an HTTP/2 server, and there's like a little cheat right there. So the, the very astute of you have, and I'm sure that's like every single person here has already seen the code. But try to create this without looking at the actual uh, exercise. Now, look at the doc documentation, because the idea is that you familiarize yourself with the documentation as your, um, your reference, so you don't have to memorize APIs and other pointless trivia fact that changes all the time. Just always refer to the, the node documentation at node.js.org slash API slash HTTP2.html. And this is nicely written, more or less. Um, if you see typos, you might want to uh, contribute a bug fix. This is more or less up to date. There's a couple of errors in there that I'll point out later that you might need to go to the latest, 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 like on the repository itself. Because there's some of the APIs that changed like a few weeks ago, and, had, and for some reason, the documentation was not rebuilt yet. Um, now, if you go here, you'll start to see there's a core API, and there's a compatibility API. So the reason for this is that there, well, OK, I'll, I'll, essentially, you have these layers of the Node.js the, the Node HTTP2 implementation. One is the, H, the ng HTTP2 library that we were talking about. So that library is the lowest level of HTTP2 implementation in Node. That's written in C. It's just included in the source code in, in the, in the Node.js repository. It's just included as a dependency, untouched. Right? There's the exact code from the ng HTTP2 repository is included into the Node.js repository. So it's completely standard. Now, the C++ part of Node.js itself is what binds to the C code of this library. And so there's a lot of C++ code that was written um, that exposes the API that NGHTP2 offers, exposes it in, in Node C++ land. So no, most of the Node.js internals are written in C++. Um, they, they con they, 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 there's this library called libuv, which is sort of a, an event loop library that does all of the the, the input output, all the networking, all the file access, all the operating system hooks, that's all C++. And it's there, it, the reason for that is because A, it's high performance, and B, it's cross-platform. So libuv kind of exposes file access and networking to like on Mac, on Windows, on Linux, with a common API. It exposes that event loop, exposes the V8, you know, JavaScript engine bindings, exposes all that in a, in a nice high performance and cross-platform manner. And so that's why we have to have C++ to connect to any other library like nghtp2, for instance. Now, because we are using JavaScript, this, this C++ layer exposes that I its own uh, API to a JavaScript 
an in, like but an, an internal JavaScript library within um, with, within a Node, and this is sort of like a, a layer where it splits into a core and a compatibility API, and we can we can use that in, in the documentation. So it's described as the core API and a compatibility API. The compatibility API is trying to mimic everything that the normal HTTP one API offers, and the reason for that is because you want to stay compatible to provide an upgrade path for people who are currently using the existing web frameworks like Happy or Express or Connect or all these things, or any kind of custom code or the node fetch, all these kind of things. You want to make it as easy as possible to migrate those projects over. So we, we, we expose all of the methods, all of the properties, uh, as long as they exist as concepts in HTTP2. We try to map them to the same API. But the core API is going to offer you access to the new concepts like push streams or the streams and the session. Um, it's going to offer you access to like the HTTP2 settings. It's going to uh, give you a lower level access. It's slightly higher performance because it doesn't do as much like wrapping and like extra lookups. But performance-wise, they're more or less the same. Uh, you, could, you can comfortably use the compatibility labor, uh, API and, and never face any issues because of that. Um, so look at the core API and just build a little Node.js server. Um, it's really quite straightforward. I'll, I mean, OK. I'm just going to go ahead and put this up here. Essentially, like I said, you get a create server method um, from the re require HTTP2, right? You import it. Uh, the, the most fundamental event that you can deal with any request is a stream. Every request is essentially a new stream. Um, a connection is a session. You can think of like a, a TCP connection as a session. And a stream is a request, more or less. Now, when you when the session uh, when the, sorry when the stream opens, you receive this stream object, which is in, in documentation, and you also get the headers already decoded. So the stream actually you only receive this event once it fully parsed and processed all of the headers. The headers could be split across multiple um, fragments. Um, so it, it sort of the, 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 the API kind of waits for all of those to come in. And once, once it's completely done, it'll give you the fully decoded, decompressed, uh, normalized, and everything sort of safe to work with headers object. And that's just a map, no prototype, just a map of raw like key value, uh, fully decoded. Uh, so I've got a little logic here to sort of show what this does. So uh, you, can, you can look at the API and document, uh, run this yourself, uh, write this yourself, or you just copy paste this and just try to run this on your system and then play around using the tools that we set up earlier, the, the, the debugging clients that we have, hit against your own local server. So yes, but now you can try to DDoS this one on your own, on your own machine. <laughs> OK. Uh, what, what's happening here is like, normally you would, uh, uh, you would do like, something like uh, send head or, or write head or whatever. I always forget the API. Uh, there's a new API here called respond where you just give it all of these headers. And re remember, the, the status code in HTTP2 is not like this magical field in the first line. It's just another pseudo header. So th when you're sending all your headers, you can now send your status code, like your 200, your 404, your 500, whatever it is. You can just send it as this colon status header name with the value being this, this number. So you just send, your, send, these, send this response. And then you, that's just going to send the header fragment out to the, to the client. And then you can send uh, any kind of data as a stream. So you can you can pipe files to your response. You can you can like do a create file uh, create create read stream from a file or take any kind of stream that you have in Node and you can pipe it to this stream, and it'll automatically flush all the data and do the buffering all really nicely. Uh, but it, this is a simple way to just send a string out there. So you, you sh if you connect to uh, your port eighty eighty with uh, your your. your yeah, no. So that's that's the key thing. The browser won't actually work right now. This is just a create server. So this is there's no TLS, there's no HTTPS or anything like that. That's why I'm doing port 8080. Uh, to me, the, the port 80 is um, so port 80 is for HTTP, and port 443 is the default port for TLS, right? So HTTP and HTTPS, you have port 80 and 443. Um, the reason why I'm using 8080 um, is because any port uh, below 1024 on Unix, you need to have sudo access. And it just complicates things needlessly. Um, and you might have already had something running on there. So I use my, 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 my values are usually, this is personal preference, is like 
8,080 and 8,443. So I just changed this 80 to a 443 in the other demos. So keep that in mind when, you, when you're requesting this, that you're not using. So if you hit this with your browser, your browser will just go like, oh, I can't connect to this at all. Um, We'll do a demo with like how to do the how to do this TLS thing uh, after this. So okay, I kind of want to see that, that we actually achieved this step. So we have have some HTTP two servers running. Anybody have a? All right. Is this your local server that you're hitting? Okay. Oh, what's that? Are hitting local host? Yeah, yeah. Looks good. And then there's data here somewhere. First response header. Oh no, data here. How many? Oh, hello. Well, there it is. It's sort of printed in line here. Nice. Good luck. Good job. You can try. Um, you can try doing things like piping a file to it or something. Like you can read a local file and pipe it to that response. How are we doing? You got it? Yeah. Awesome. That was good. That was quick. Oh, that's, so the colon thing, that's a pseudo header. Uh, pseudo, like P-S-E-U-D-O. So it's basically, when in, in, in HTTP2, you don't have this, like in, in HTTP1, you have like uh, get space, uh, HTTP slash 1.1 space and then slash the URL, right? The, the path. So that's the first line of the request. But in H2, you don't have like a line of your request anymore. It's binary. So there's no concept of like the first line. And so to, to still have those concepts, they sort of map it to these pseudo headers. So, so each part of that, so the, the method, there's like colon method header. <coughs> and then the status is like the 200, right? It's like colon status. And then there's like colon path for the slash blah, blah, blah. So they map all of that to pseudo headers because then it just fits into the, the HPAC header compression. And so this header frame just contains header, 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 header. And then this HPAC compresses the whole thing, no matter what it is. Right? A header can have any name. So it's just colon status, colon path. It's all just the same. So it compresses it. So that's why it maps this, this concept a little bit. But yeah, we still have to deal with, like now in HP2, if you request HP2, you have these kind of pseudo headers and you don't have the, the st standard. That's why in the compatibility layer, you can actually treat it like the normal HTTP1 API. Mm -hmm. But in the core, with the core API that you're using now, you, you have to deal with like colon status and colon path. How are you doing? Oh, you're uh, linting my code, huh? Okay. <laughs> you got it, yeah? All good here? Is yeah. it working? Or? Oh, it's still typing. Ah, okay, okay. You, oh, you prefer to type instead of copy it? Mm -hmm. Stream respond. Oh, it's a respond. Oh, respond. Okay. How are you guys? Yeah? Oh, really? That's it. Oh, thank you for coming to the workshop. So, I just run the server. Uh huh, okay. You got it running? Yeah. And then use the. Uh, this one? Yeah. NGH. Not the X. X is a server. Or a proxy. HTTP. Yeah, NGHPT. Uh, yeah. And then just like uh, HTTP, HTTP localhost. And then maybe you want to do verbose. 80. Nice. Hello world. So you can see all the frames here. You can see like the headers frame coming out with the pseudo headers and everything in there. Yep. Yeah. What's going on? I just copy and paste. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, how's it going? Oh. Something wrong? I know it's uh, new for me. It's ah, okay, okay. It was new for me, so I'm just. Uh, oh, you're reading, this is an excellent idea. Yes. I'm just uh, reading those topics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have, you, have you got Node on your computer? Uh, 
Three. Have you got Node on your computer? Oh, yeah. Right, okay. And then, uh, d d have you tried the exercise thing? Uh, yeah, it was... Uh, you ran so it? I'm just uh, watching this uh, okay. exercise. Okay. Okay. Do you, do you want to help? Any help? Uh, that's okay. I can manage. <laughs> okay. You prefer... I mean, it's fine if you want to read on your own. That's, that's okay. 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 How's, how's it going? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. You got your own. But if it doesn't work with... Oh, you're trying to turn it yeah. into HTML? Yeah. <laughs> Where's the port? Yeah, so it doesn't work there, that's right. Yeah. So the browser doesn't allow uh, HTTP to without encryption. Oh, okay, okay. So we'll show, I'll show like how to set it up with encryption locally and all that. Because it's kind of tedious, painful sometimes. I think you need to use the, this one, right? Like, so locally generate yeah. your own private key Yes, yes, yes. Is this one the thing? Mm. So look at, look at my tutorial. I mean, you can skip ahead, I guess. Uh, so there's a. I made it. I, I just. I, I have like some. Yeah, I have some tools and whatever. But um, yeah, I just. I've just published this last night. I mean, I've been using this forever, but I never, never had a public. Yeah. <laughs> Try it out. Hey. What am I missing? Hang on. Um, Hmm. What is this? Copy and run. Wait, can I? Okay, hang on here. Can I read property PFX of anything? Oh, this, I think this is already a different exercise. I think you copied from the second one, maybe. Could it be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is already the secure server. So the first is the basic server. Oh, can I try again? So, that's funny. This looks, this looks okay, but can you make sure that this is safe? And then try to run the file. Oh, you're using them. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we have to get that here. Should I just sign the modules? We will empty and sign it. Hmm? What? For me, sorry, to do two server was originated. What is this? Um, can I see node? <coughs> I think I see what's happening. Okay, so. Your, the version of Node is very, very old, and so you did an npm install of HTTP2, which is somehow like a module that's really old, and basically it'll get fixed by upgrading to Node 9.4.0, the latest current released. So I have to update Node. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. No worries. Mm. I can I can curl it and I can use H2. Ah, yeah, but not in the browser. That I can't, why can't I do it on the browser? The browser doesn't allow HTTP to plain text. It doesn't allow oh, plain text. Oh, okay, okay. So you can only do HTTPS. Oh, but I thought normally it allows that. Only for HTTP1, but for HTTP2, they did not do that. I can, I can talk about why. Okay. Because everyone's having that now. I think that's good. Everyone's getting to that point. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Excellent. Works, yeah, yeah. Why? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone use uh, ng-http to connect to it, I guess, right? Most people seem to be doing that because that's what we were using before. If anyone used curl, they might find that it's not possible to just connect uh, by default. That's why I've changed the command here sneakily to this dash dash http2 dash prior dash knowledge. Uh, this is basically telling curl that, don't worry, this is http2. Because otherwise, you might be wondering, like, how does, how does a browser or any user agent know wh which protocol to use? Uh, if you're using http2, it's all binary. It's like a completely different handshake. When the, when the browser or the client sends its request, it's completely different on the wire than what an http1 client would send. And so you wouldn't even be able to connect to this. You might have also noticed that your browser 
struggles to open this in a page. Right? Uh, some people have reported this now. Like, if you open this in a browser, it just doesn't load. And it shows you some TLS or some whatever protocol error thing. Now, um, so for curl, you can, you can tell it that don't, you have to use HTTP2, 100% double confirm, HTTP2, prior knowledge. Right? If you just do dash dash HTTP2, it'll try to do what's called an upgrade mechanism, which is a, a way that the, the, the HTTP2 protocol declares that um, to, a, to an HTTP1 client with a specific header, with the upgrade header, that says, I also support HTTP2, which tells the client to then sort of switch to HTTP2 mode and start sending HTTP2 traffic on that same connection. So that's a very slow, you know, there's, an, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wasted round trip again there. Um, and that's just not very efficient. So browsers have sort of not implemented that. Another reason is that they don't, they, another reason why they don't support uh, HTTP2 over plain, plain text connections unencrypted, like at all, um, is because it's really problematic to deploy that on the internet. Uh, if you introduce these kind of huge breaking changes, like an entire new protocol, there is so much infrastructure out there in terms of like proxy servers. They're called middle boxes in sort of the, 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 st the standard speak. Um, there's so many middle boxes. You know, that could be firewalls, that could be like logging servers on, on corporate networks. Uh, all kinds of optimizers, caches for like mobile phones that are automatically transparently compressing your images and sort of all this infrastructure exists that makes it impossible to really deploy things in plain text because they assume that if it's plain text that they can mess around with it. And they just end up breaking HTTP2 if you send it in plain text because they, 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 they're built for an HTTP1 world and now no longer, they, they don't recognize the protocol and updating all of that stuff would basically be a situation where you can never update it because nobody would do it unless there's a need to and it would only be need to if everyone's already upgraded. So you get this chicken and egg thing. And that's why you can really only introduce huge new protocol changes by fully encrypting everything and saying only like the slightest amount of uh, bits in that, hand <clears throat> in that handshake, excuse me. Uh, uh, excuse me. Okay. So <clears throat> that's why we have to use uh, uh, HTTPS to for the, for the for the browsers to actually support it. Now, so curl and a lot of other command tools they don't really care about that. They're just like there for debugging. And the protocol, the spec actually the spec describes how you can do it over TLS and how you can do it without TLS. And the spec describes like this upgrade mechanism. So so a lot of these command line tools they'll actually support it. Node also Node, Node supports like we saw. Our, uh, plain text, and there's also a client built into the, no the Node HTTP2 implementation that, that can connect to um, a plain text HTTP2 server. But that's really only useful for uh, like machine to machine, like an API call to another API call, if you want to skip over the whole TLS thing, uh, or, for, or for like writing unit tests, like if you're trying to hit a server and you don't want to set up like certificates, uh, self-signed certificates, and deal with all this uh, self-signed hassle on your CI server, for instance, you can just make a plain text connection to that. Um, so, but in the real world, when, you, when you're dealing with users on browsers, you're going to need TLS. OK. So uh, bef OK, maybe before that, let's, let's compare it with the, the core API that we've been using now with this stream. Uh, we can compare this to the compatibility API. So you notice here, we've got um, still the same create server, uh, but we're providing it a callback right in the uh, create server call. So in the first example, um, we just did a create server and we did not pass it any uh, callback, right? It was just, we, we get a return value, which immediately, synchronously, we get this server object back, the server instance, and then we attach an event handler to stream. Now, the, the, this, this is how you enable, and this is a very subtle way, I'm not a big fan of it, but it, this is a subtle way to enable compatibility API by passing an event handler to create server. Yeah, this is sort of the tricky part. Like, so you, you might do this by default, because this is generally how you uh, handle requests on HTTP 1. So you, you create server, and you give it a callback for any kind of, uh, it's a request callback, right? So the request event. So the request event uh, in the core API, we don't use that. We just use the stream event. And we have a session event also, but we use a stream event to deal with a request. And we get the headers, and we then send data back on that stream. But this, the request and response objects are only part of the compatibility API. And these are the ones that expose all of the, the sort of the HTTP1 legacy API stuff. 
They, they expose all of the same uh, methods and properties, like I said. And so if, if, we, if we pass this callback in there, you get a, a standard, like an, an, a, a familiar request object and a familiar response object. And you can, you can use them to sort of use the, the familiar APIs, like write head with a number, and then a, a map of headers. Uh, and then again, you can use a stream to just end, to close it off with a, a string part, pass it, pass it back out. So if you, if you run this, you'll get more or less the same thing, but now using compatibility API. Um, if you log uh, like the request object, you'll see that it looks very different from the stream object. Uh, so it has these different properties. The low level ones are going to be on the stream, and the high level ones are going to be on request. So one thing you might be wondering is like, OK, what, well, what if I have a request, and I want to access the lower level stuff? Luckily, it's just exposed request.stream, and you get access to the lower level stuff again. But you, might, you, can, you can see how that could be a slight hit on performance. So if you're going for like a benchmarking tool with some really high performance code, you might want to stick to the core API uh, without sort of the overhead of wrapping all of these objects and uh, doing that extra parsing to expose its compatibility layer. But it's there. So in, in most cases, you can just use the compatibility API because it, it gives you all of that functionality of the middleware that you're already using with, with whatever framework that you're, that you're on right now. It gives you all of that like out of the box. Uh, pretty much works with, well, I'm not going to say it works with everything, but it works pretty well. And it's very familiar. If you've, got, if you've been using HTTP and on, on Node for a couple of years, then this is going to be very, very familiar. So just change it to HTTP to get the HTTP version of it, and then oh, yeah. we do a load test on, just on this to see like oh HTTP two versus HTTP one was faster. Uh, that's, that's right. Cool. Okay, so that makes sense. So I mean, okay, feel free to uh, change the code that you had to to, to maybe this one. Uh, run it. And see what see what happens. So, uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, maybe I should clarify this this little guy here. It's not an emoji. That's an IPv6 local address. <laughs> So the IPv4 would be like 127.0.0.1. With IPv6, because the addresses are really, really long, there's like this uh, abbreviated notation. And, and I, like the local host address, essentially, for IPv6 is just colon, colon. It's just completely abbreviated, colon, colon. Um, but because the HTTP URL uh, has like the colon for your port, you kind of have to like wrap your IPv6 colon colon in these square brackets. So essentially, this becomes your host name, where this is the IP address. Like the double colon is your IP address, and the square brackets is just there to like say this is the host name part of the URL. And then the this colon here, 8080, is just a divider between the port and the host name, the separator. So that's why you'll you'll see this in a lot of places, and it's it trips it trips me up many many times. Uh, I, I and I fix bugs in people's frameworks now like a lot where. I see people forgetting to actually wrap them, and you end up seeing URLs like HTTP colon slash slash and then triple colon, and you're like, what is the going on here? <laughs> yeah, people forget about that all the time. It's an it's a annoying little gotcha. So I just wanted to put that in there to make sure we, everyone's aware of that. OK, now, um, so let's get on to why, like, fixing this for the browser. So TLS, right? Like I was saying, the reason why we have to use TLS is because of compatibility, really. Like without TLS, it would just break. We would never be able to roll out HP2 because it would be trying to patch a huge change onto an existing protocol that has massive adoption, and nobody would really want to implement uh, that. So there's this chicken and egg thing. So the spec allows plain text, but you really just want to use uh, uh, you really just want to use it over TLS. Um, so. The spec actually refers to a TLS 1.3 in one in one part in one place, but TLS 1.3 doesn't officially exist yet. Um, and the HTTP2 spec came out a while ago. They were very optimistic that the TLS 1.3 would be settled, and they continue to be optimistic. And so, like a month ago, they were they were saying, "Oh, we should we should uh, probably push back." They were thinking that it'll be out in March or April this year, but now it's probably going to get back, pushed back to like mm, Q3, Q4 of this year. And we'll see, right? So TLS 1.3 is a work in progress. Right now, we're on TLS 1.2.
And despite the small change in version number, there's like 10 years of difference between them. Um, so don't, uh, don't underestimate. TLS 1.3 is almost an entire new kind of protocol than TLS 1.2. Um, one of the key changes, right, is um, the, the, the sort of the, the design of TLS in the past until uh, up and until including 1.2 was sort of this layered approach of protocols. So you, you would first establish uh, a TCP socket, which means that you send, uh, you send something to the server, to a, a SYN packet, and then you get back this acknowledgement, and you would send back your own acknowledgement to the server again. So there would be like this, 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 this round trip going on before you could start your TLS handshake. Now the TLS handshake is again, the client saying, hey, I want to do TLS, and then the server going, oh, okay, these are the certificates that I have and the mechanisms that I support, and then the client going back and saying, here's, okay, here's the one that I want to use, and then the server going, okay, now we're, now we're connected, now you can send your request. So, but t uh, so we now have TL TCP one, one round trip, and then TLS two more round trips before we can even get into the HTTP request that we actually just want to send. And so we're dealing with minimum of four round trips, which is unacceptable in, in, in most environments. That's very wasteful. Um, you should be able to just transfer the whole thing. And that has been a design goal of um, Quick, which is essentially the new sort of transport layer for HTTP uh, that replaces this whole TCP TLS thing with a modular approach where you, s you would send a single UDP datagram that includes the quick session negotiating thing, that includes your TLS 1.3 you know, certificate algorithm kind of selections, as well as your HTTP request, all in a single datagram. So that goes out from the client to the server, and the server says, okay, for quick, we will do this, for TLS 1.3, we will do that, and here's your, your, here's your response for your request on HTTP. So you can get back the entire thing in, in a single round trip. And from then on, your, your server can even start pushing, so you never have to actually send out uh, a sort of a think time request where you're waiting for the server to respond. Right? So you, you, could, you get to completely eliminate the uh, wasted round trips that you would have with TLS 1.2. So that's sort of where that's going. Uh, I will say that neither, neither Quick nor TLS 1.3 are like standardized right now. Uh, but if you open up your browser inspector, you'll see that when you connect to Google.com or YouTube or something, or, or maybe even some Facebook sites, you'll see that these guys are already playing around with it. You know, even some CDNs like Cloudflare, they, they, they'll, once in a while you'll see them announce that, oh, they, they support TLS 1.3, don't worry, it totally works. What they support is maybe more like G-Quick or G-TLS 1.3, um, or, well, like draft versions of TLS 1.3. And uh, earlier versions of Quick were um, sort of published by Google because it, the, a lot of that research was, was, was originally done there before it moved into the IETF working group. Do you, do you want to make a statement? Or? Just really quick. Yeah. Uh, because it started raining a little bit, the hotel is telling me that All right, so don't get like struck by lightning on the beach party by yourself or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, so okay, that's a little bit of a background and you know, what's gonna happen soon with uh, Quick and HTTP2 and TLS. Um, here's some of the things that we're using from, HT from, from TLS 1.2 right now to make this HTTP2 stuff work and some of the things that you can use to make it even better. So. Alpine, if you saw the curl debug stuff, this ALPN, Alpine, this is what, it, what it's using to connect to the server and figure out whether this HTTPS URL is using HTTP2 or HTTP1. Uh, so because, because of this stack, or this layered approach, there's first a TCP connection handshake, this round trip. When it does the first uh, round trip, when the client makes the first round trip of the TLS handshake, it basically includes a little, a little bit of information that says, I support HTTP2, but I also support HTTP 1.1. The server receives this in the initial handshake and says, okay, I'm gonna serve you HTTP 1.1 or I'm gonna serve you HTTP 2. So that's, that's, that's really the handshake that's called Alpine. And in Node, uh, that's now exposed with a simple property called allow HTTP 1. So this defaults to false. You have to actually opt into the backwards compatibility. Uh, I forget why we made it false by default. So basically, you have to like pretty much always set this because yeah, I, I would like. I think by default you would want to have 
HTTP 1.1 backwards compatibility. Um, it seems like a good idea, but you know, you can you could leave it turned off if you maybe like a year from now you go like well, whatever it works everywhere it's fine. Um, so that's that's one that's one mechanism that we're using. You'll, you you might come across this name, so now you can sound smart and talk about it. Um, SNI, another one that's the server name identification. Um, SNI is basically how you put a lot of different host names on a single single host on a single IP address. Uh, HTTP one would use the host header for that. I think it's actually HTTP one point one that introduced it. HTTP one point oh, you still had like you had to have like one IP address for one server because when you connect to a server. You just go like, I want this. I have this path name that I want to request with this method, but the server wouldn't know which domain you're requesting it from. So it would have to say, okay, this IP address I'm receiving this connection on, that's configured to be this host name. And with HTTP 1.1, they were like, okay, okay, this is getting expensive to like maintain all these different IP addresses, and so they introduced this host header, host colon and then example .net, right? That's that's the domain I want to connect to. And let's, let's say that you're hosting, uh, uh, you're hosting a Many, many, many websites on your shared server. A lot of like cheap hosting, or like you know, you pay like a dollar a month for your website hosting. They'll they'll basically be one server, with one IP address that hosts ten thousand websites, right? Um, they rely on that host header to map like your request to the correct set of files to serve, or to the correct PHP to code to run, or whatever you want to do. Uh, so, in um, HTTP two, that's happening uh, like a step earlier at the TLS level. The TLS one point two has this extension called SNI, the server name identification, which you can use now in TLS to serve the correct certificate because you can't even get the request yet. You don't get that host header uh, you know, by the, before you get to serve your certificate. So when you have a lot of hosts on one server, you need to consider that they would all be, um, they might all have a different certificate, a TLS certificate. Um, you don't want to have like the same certificate for 100 sites. If that gets compromised, then you're in a whole bunch of trouble. If you need to revoke it, you end up revoking everyone at the same time. So there's complexities there. And the reasons why you would not want to limit the number of hosts, uh, domain names on a single certificate. So you need to be able to figure out which certificate to serve to the request before you get to the HTTP level. That's why we use this thing called SNI to say, OK, we've, I'm going to give you this certificate uh, at the handshake level, the TLS level. Then later in the HTTP2 level, there's no more a hosts header now that was deprecated and turned into the authority uh, pseudo header, this colon authority. So that's where like I, I get that confused a lot of times. Host, origin, authority. I, I kind of like uh, mix them, mix them, mix and match them a little bit too too many times. Um, but basically, okay, Alpine SNI, and then the last one I want to show is a uh, OCSP. Um, this is okay. What is O again? Certificate stapling protocol, like offline maybe, or something. I don't know. Uh, essentially, what? Okay. So one problem is that when you issue a certificate to a um, for your domain, you, you get a certificate from a from a certificate authority, and then you go to your web host and you give them the certificate to serve your content on your domain. Um, maybe at some point you you save that in like sort of an an, uh, an insecure location on your computer that got hacked or you leaked it somehow. Uh, and you need to revoke that certificate. Um, sure, you could go and take it down from the website. You get a new certificate and upload it to your web server. But everyone else might all, might still have that certificate, right? And you need to be able to tell them, hey, this this is no longer valid. Stop using it, please. And so, what's happening is that the certificate itself includes a URL where the client can verify with the certificate authority whether or not this is still valid, or with, or is it on a revocation list. So whenever you make a connection to a web server, um, your client, your browser is going to actually make a make a do do an extra check. And again, this is a round trip that you're, that's happening that's delaying your load time. And so there's a protocol called OCSP that called staples. So it, it basically staples that response onto the certificate as it's being served to the client. And so stapling means that the server, the web server itself, actually periodically goes and gets the latest sort of uh, validity result and just staples it on. So rather than every single browser making those calls, like if you have a, a huge website uh, and you have every single browser hitting that certificate authority, they're going to suffer. Like they need to set up a huge amount of infrastructure just to handle these uh, revocation checks. And so it's better that the web server itself just periodically checks it and includes it, st sticks it onto um, that certificate and, and gives it to the client, where the client then goes, like, okay, this is still recent enough for me to consider it as non-revoked. And it also eliminates that round trip. It, so it eliminates the round trip for the for for that client, 
so it doesn't need to like make another connection to another host and do another DNS lookup, because that could be very expensive. So it's faster and it's less load on the CA server, so it's cheaper. So it's just generally better to do this. But by default, this is actually turned off um, in all node servers of TLS. So you, you, need, you need to do a little bit of code to make this work. So I'll show you from one of my projects how I do that. Um, if you ever need to ref reference it, uh, just you know, look at this as an example. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm using this thing called uh, just require OCSP. OK. And then I build a cache, and I basically, this is basically a, 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 a snippet from the, oops, make it a little bigger. OK, so the OCSP cache is essentially what I'm using to store uh, the certificates that I've, that I've done the lookup for, right? So whenever I get a request, my server uh, fires this event. This is a standard TLS node event. This is not new to, to uh, this is not new in, um, in, in, in HTTP2. This is, if you're using HTTPS right now, you, you could get this event, and you're probably, if you're not handling it right now, you're wasting all these round trips, and your, your users are making all these extra calls. Um, so if you just want to Im improve the performance of like standard HTTPS, you should still do this right now. Um, basically, this is like caching the responses as they come back. Your server makes that request to look it up if it doesn't have a currently valid uh, st sort of stapled response. Um, and otherwise, it pulls it out of a cache and serves it directly. So it's really fast. This is the big concept, sort of stapling. Makes sense now? A little bit? OK. All right. So question now is, how do we do this local host certificate? Uh, I had this for, 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 for a long time now. I've had, a bit, I've had like some, well, it started with like just going on a Stack Overflow every time and trying to find the right copy paste to open SSL command line stuff. It's, it got very tedious, so I, I started automating it. And I, I, just last night, to make this easier here, I, I published this TLS key gen on NPM. So you should be able to just generate it by running that on your system. It'll just generate a key.pem and a cert.pem. And, and it'll try, if you're on Mac or Linux, not Windows, sorry, but because um, I, I, I didn't have any machine to test it on yet, um, it will try to sort of set it up on your computer so that your computer trusts it. And that, that's very convenient if you're doing like local development, then your browser is not going to show you those like security content warnings and get, get really annoying when you try to do anything in the browser, basically. So you can, you can use this tool to generate a certificate, have it trusted, and then you use those certificates on any software that you're, that you're working with uh, in, 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 in Node.js uh, with TLS. A um, couple of things that it does, just to give you like, some insights into TLS itself. Um, the tool that you're using is OpenSSL. So most of you will have that installed already. If not, brew, in, brew install or yum or apt-get or whatever. Um, this has got this thing called SAN. Um, service alternate names, I think. Subject, thank you, OK. So subject alternate names. Um, basically, I, the certificate can have a single common name, the CN that we saw, which describes the, the domain name for the certificate. But ov over time, people were like, OK, well, I want to have like a bunch more names, and then wildcard names, and IP addresses, and all kinds of things. And so this, this extension was added to, TL to TLS certificates, where you can then describe a bunch more domain names, and it'll all get signed on one certificate. It's very convenient when you want to have like your example.com, and then your www.example.com on one certificate, right? Instead of having two. So when you reconnect, you can reuse it. So basically, this tool sets it up so that you have local host, you have wildcard local host, you have like 127.001, you have your IPv6, you have 0000, like all your like local stuff, and it, the same certificate works for any of them. So when you go into the browser, you don't have to remember like, okay, is it, is it 127 or is it local host? And then when, if you want to exper <coughs> experiment with like different domain names, you can just do something, something dot localhost, and you can set it up in your Etsy, Etsy hosts file to map it to, the same, so to your local host, and it'll all resolve with a squidic valid certificate. Um, then also, it's using ECC, which is like elliptic curve cryptography. Um, now, I'm not a cryptographer, but usually when you see smaller numbers, it means less secure. But uh, with, with um, typical TLS certificates, and you'd have this RSA 2048 or uh, 4096 or whatever. You have these big, big numbers. The reason those are big numbers is because the certificate is actually that size. It's that many bits. 
And in this case, you, on, you can achieve similar levels of security with only 256 bits using this elliptic curve cryptography stuff. Um, so that's really nice. And it's actually recommended at, uh, by, by some US government thing, uh, NIST, some you know, inf whatever standards, technology, whatever stuff. They recommend like these, basically the baselines for what level of security do you need for, um, um, for their operations. And this is sort of generally accepted in the industry as like whatever, what, people, what people use on the internet. And so right now, if you're using like RSA 200, uh, 2048, you can just use uh, this, the, this, uh, this, this, this elliptic, this ECC P256 or P384. This is slightly larger in terms of key, but I think they're kind of rating them as pretty much the same in terms of security strength. And so P256 is more supported. There have been issues in the past where P384 was, I think it was like nodes versions 9.0 to 9.2 or 3. It was like temporarily not supported, now it came back. So it's a little bit of a pain. If you want to just feel like, okay, this is a bigger number, I want to use that, go for it. Um, but this is totally sufficient. Um, the real risk is not even like we have to go bigger. There's a, there's a whole other different curve now coming out because so there's some weird speculation and stuff going on that this might be compromised and NSA will like break it and whatever. I don't know. I don't think they're going to come after CopyGS, but if your website is like super important, then you might have to worry about that. There's a, so anyway, there's, these are called curves. Um, these are like co sh uh, short codes for curves, and there's a new curve coming out. Uh, I forget what's like like. Um, X255 something 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 so uh, but that's all still going through ITF process and reviewing and it takes it takes a long time for to get adoption so you could use it but it's probably not going to work in most browsers um, so these like I would say stick with P256 or RSA 2048 if you want to be like, compatible and well supported today um, anyway. so this tool basically does that for you so um, try it out right now this is going to help you with like general development run npx tls dash keygen and see what happens it's quite untested so i want to see i want to hear what goes wrong i have a question sure syntax, um, syntax error subdomaining on your local ah so in your SE host. yeah so SE hosts right? you could you could you could just say foobar dot localhost oh okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but the certificate is a wildcard, so it'll validate yeah. that. Okay, right. Yeah. In theory. Right, right. <laughs> Script error, what was it? <laughs> I, I can't really tell. Um, I also have syntax error. Oh, no. Oh, we, okay, you. Uh, huh? what, uh, what are you running? Where's the command? npx tls keygen. Hey. Can you do node dash v, please? Hmm. Hmm. How come we didn't work? Hmm. Seems like there's a syntax error. Is that, can anyone confirm that? Yes. Okay, okay, sorry. Let me take a look. Um, What's the line? Does it say which file in line? Line one. Does it say the file name? What am I not seeing? You're saying there's a, there's a typo here? Why not? It's just destructuring it. Which node? Nine four zero. Um. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you can you could take the snippet and run it actually. Or, but why is it why is it wrong? Anyone see the issue? Set up to uh, Where is that? No, no, that's fine. Okay. 
Oh yeah, I was just doing that to escape these bracket, the, the, the other quotes. Okay. Um, runs on my machine. <laughs> let me see, let me see if it runs on the this guy. Uh, Tulis Kijun. That's cool. Oh. That's a weird one. More chairs at the back, apparently. You don't expect a token parentis. I think they're right. Um, I know, yeah. I'm just, yeah. Try, try to, try. Okay, can you, can, can anyone try to do npm install? Like dev. Let's see. Let's, let's see. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, let me try. Um, I'm just installing it in my local directory now, the workspace that we had, and then TLS keygen. Yeah, that's funny. Hmm, okay. Yeah, right? <coughs> Voodoo. So, if, okay, so, okay, we can just run it directly then, you're saying? So if we just do node mod. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, all right, so sorry, sorry about this weirdness. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what's going on. I have a hint. But anyway, uh, run it this way. Just run uh, npm install. Hang on, let me. So you, you do npm install dash uppercase d tls dash keygen. That'll set it up as a local dev dependency. And then you do node, uh, and then in your node modules, tls dash keygen cli.js. Hmm. <coughs> It's funny, from the bin it fails, but it's exactly the same file. It's like oh, can you show me? So, so the system didn't detect this as a, as a <laughs> process, so it just did that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
I don't know. What's the, what's the standard one? <laughs> like that? Okay. Yay, thank you. <coughs> okay, so you could just do the npx TLS keygen right now. It should be fixed. <laughs> okay. Um, so has anyone managed to generate a key in a certificate and then gone through the pseudo thing and all that? Yeah? Yeah, it worked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can you can verify whether or not that actually did anything. Just so you know, I'm not like stealing everyone's passwords here. Um, open up this keychain access tool on Mac, at least on Linux. I'm not too sure. You can essentially see if you search for localhost, it should have some certificates here. Uh, passwords. What am I talking about? Certificates. Yeah. So I use this. I use this thing a lot, like this technique a lot. So I've got a bunch of them. You should have at least one here. Has anyone seen that? Okay. You, so if you ever need to do this manually, this is what you do. You just drag the certificate file onto this keychain access thing. You would double click on the um, PEM file. And for SSL on trust settings, you just put on always trust. And from that moment on, most software that integrates well with Mac OS, like Chrome browser or Safari, they will just trust that certificate for connections that are on this, for domains that are on this certificate. So you can see, for instance, in this case, it would be localhost plus the wildcards plus my local IP address, etc. So these kind of, this, this is like now a certificate that I can use with software without having to face like all these browser issues. So the TLS keygen tool just automates as much as possible there.
Sorry, just for a little bit. Yeah, I know. That's why, that's why I ended up doing this in a module. Uh, common name would just be like localhost. And then these are just concatenated with semicolon. Any luck? No, I, I can't. I have the same problem. I, I can't generate it. Okay. Thank you. Is the OpenSSL command on your systems? Yeah. Using the shell. And what, what is it? So, can you try it in the regular standard terminal thing without all the. Like this is item 2 or something, right? Because I think when Node runs it, it's just running it in plain bash, right? I'm not, I'm not too sure, but. He's also got like a funky looking terminal like that. Mine's very vanilla. <laughs> oh. oh, is it? <laughs> oh, it was I term as well? Or not? You can try yours. My team looks funny. Yours. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, what? What? Uh -huh. Did you. We're in what now? Well, what node version is this one? Because now you don't have NGM anymore. Sure. <laughs> Hey, you got it right. Okay, so it runs here. Okay, no, no. It oh wait, no. So, so this part is fine, right? But yeah. now you got to do key and perm, uh, key perm and cert perm. Do we have anything there? Oh. No, <laughs> I don't think. It's no, no. It, no, no. That, that's normal, actually. So that's actually a help message. Wait, was that the whole thing the whole time? No, just type. Key perm. Key and perm, yeah. Oh, we supposed to just do that. Maybe. Oh man. <laughs> oh, <damn. laughs> okay, that was really my baddest bad UX right there. <laughs> Welcome. Hang one second, I gotta save him. Okay, C can you show me the command again that you're running? This one? No, 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 the one on the CLI, right? Which one is it? So when you run the. Uh, when you run CLI.js? Because they simply, f they, 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 they switched over to the regular terminal, but then they also, I think, simply oh, forgot. Okay. Uh, no, no, not necessarily, but try, try, for, try, I want to just see first. Yeah, okay, no. Oh, no, that, that. Yeah, no, that, that seems to work for only they, they just forgot to do the key.pem and cert.pem. Yeah, that's no, different. Okay, but it's I haven't tried out to run CLI. Directly. Could be something there as well. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, yeah. Oh, npm install on that thing. I guess so. Uh, yeah. that's, just, that's the normal one. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's like the file is not there. I don't know if it just wasn't generated or if it's in the wrong location. Yeah, it could be See if there's anyone else with this one. Okay. Ah, yeah. It just doesn't go here? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. This is like my really bad UX. You basically have to you have to supply this part. Ah, okay. Then yeah. yeah. Oh, with, sorry, with the with the spaces, I guess. Hey, what was this? <laughs> I'm not sure. Mm. Oh, okay, that's his problem. Also, he's got the same issue. Can you try running it in a regular terminal? I, and then make sure you have like Node 9.4. Ah, um, my name is... Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. Time. Alright, so... He's working on uh, debugging it also. But, um, 
Okay. Oh, temporarily. Yeah, yeah. So now we've got two cases of that. Hmm. So it says that they can't find the, the, the key file, the cert file, or which one? Yeah, the cert file. Yeah. Can you try making it like a like an absolute path? So what is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just yeah, and then the other one. Okay. Is, that, is it now saying the full thing there? Mm -hmm. Reading. Okay, so what is that about? Um, can you open up that code? I'm oh, sorry. Okay, and then go to the setup TLS. Okay, so actually what I want to see, right? Uh, wait, spawn sync. So what, what we want to see is like this whole thing, what's actually happening. So he's trying to deconstruct this now. Ah, okay. Because it's got like some, some nested shells and like nested within nested mm -hmm. and like kind of weird stuff. Okay. Yeah, mm, I'm wondering if it's because I'm setting the shell to Bashner. Oh, yeah. Mm. You know, I don't know what you're using. Is it fish or something? Or? ZSH. Is that it? Okay. Hmm. Could be something with that. <laughs> Do you want to change? Using some kind of because yeah, you guys all have like interesting shells. Uh, okay, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. This is tricky, man. This is very tricky. My OS is outdated. Outdated? What do you mean? Yeah. Is it? Really old one. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. Maybe. Hang on. Maybe. Maybe. Are you on High Sierra? Uh, no. Video. He's got Yosemite, which is like, I think around the same era. Yosemite is one version of that, I think. Yeah, yeah, around, around. So, because I've only tested it with High Sierra. Could be an issue there? Maybe the open, maybe the open SSL syntax changed. Can you update open SSL somehow? Just <laughs> Because I don't, I don't, I don't want to ask you to update the OS, you know? I just like as an experiment to try with open SSL and later version. Mm. Mm. Oh, open open setup TLS right now right now. What? The set, setup TLS you have, you have setup TLS in your code right? The, sorry, the JavaScript file for setup TLS the, the TLS keygen thing. Yeah. Um, can you switch this on new key RSA? Yeah, switch this on and switch this on off. Because maybe it's just like not supporting ECC. Yes. Let's see. Is this a version of Cypher mismatch? Is it something going my whole whole file Because I'm not sure what to actually do in this this step. So, okay. Sh show me the, the website again. The browser, yeah. Can try changing it to localhost. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Eight four four three. Site can't provide a secure connection and supported protocol. Okay, can I see your. Uh, how are you running that one? The, the, your, your snippet? I'm running the. the yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. So, yeah, I just need a shortcut, but I can do. Okay. okay, so it's. Is it listening? Not exactly. So I did the call. Is there anything else running right now? Not that I know of. At least not on port 8443. You sure? Can you, like, you want to net stat? Net stat dash an. I don't know how to set. Is there any you know, is a search or something? 
sure you grab the... <laughs> yeah, probably better. <laughs> Something's listening. This is fish. Okay, okay, it's so gone now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. So, this guy is saying cannot. An unsupported protocol. Man. Is there something to do in this step? Because I didn't do anything. Oh, this is Windows, right? No, no this is Mac. Mac. Okay, hang on. Yeah, <laughs> Hackintosh? Hack Switch. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <Listen. laughs> uh, I mean, my host file is mm. a little bit messy, I have to admit. That's fine, that's fine. I mean, you shouldn't even have needed it because you're, yeah. you, 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 you work for Sephora? <laughs> cool. Cool. Hey, you, you know um, uh, Yvonne? From Yvonne. No? I think she's a designer there. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know. Oh, she used to be there. Oh, okay. Never mind. Um, you should, you should, if you're just using localhost, you shouldn't need it, actually. Oh. It's only like if you want to set up like subdomains on localhost and stuff like that. Oh. Kind of like what you were doing there. But um, this one. Hmm? What is that last line comment? Oh, no, this is just oh, right. it's like a, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I, get I can see you had a very rough night. <laughs> 541 and you're still coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. That's pretty much. But there are guys around here who managed to get it working, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But like, uh, that's, this is the thing with like experimental stuff. Like, there's so many edge cases on platforms that have not yet been ironed out, which is part of the fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if the way I've generated could oh. be the keys that I've generated are wrong. I just can got you, it. Can from. you open up the keys? Like double, just double click the key, uh, double click the search file. Uh, I no, I meant in, in Finder. Mm. So it'll open up here. And then, I don't think it's that one. Hang on, it just doesn't scroll to the correct one. So it's search for localhost maybe. You don't have it set up at all. Uh, okay. Try to try to drag it in here. Some, is there a way to add it? I think normally this. By double clicking, you should. I, I'm usually. A Unless this key is not generated properly. Hmm. The way I generated it quite a bit more. I just I just went to stack or try and copy some random stuff. The OpenSSL and changed location. The have changed what location? Ooh. Oh man. What is it called now? For my set here. So Damn. Basically, <laughs> that is. God. Okay. What? Hey, where is it? <coughs> yeah, not found. Ah, so you gotta find it somehow. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, just look at it. If you locate it, let me know, man. Let me know. This is. Yeah, well, oh, you got it from Brew. Yeah, I, I generated it. How how do you mean? As in, I I can generate the certificate now. I think. But how did you generate the that, that config? Because I thought that was like a system thing. It seems like every system I tried it, it had it like Linux, Mac. But it might be like a recent thing. You got it from user local. That's that's Homebrew, right? Yeah, I have a Homebrew. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. I'll, I'll have to put a fallback on that one. Can you maybe make an issue on the... Sure. But the thing is, I hmm. I actually have two openings. out. This is one mm. by Mac, I think. Yeah, this is like an old one. one. Mm. Oh, yeah. But somehow supplying the one from the other side. No, I think this one is from the Mac one. Mac one. Yeah. And mm, this one like is a brew one. You're right. You're right. Is it not just a sim link? I don't know. But like, if you can, you cat cat them just simply see what see if there's any obvious difference. Oh boy, it's a big file. Yeah, it's a big file. TSA config. What the heck? I'm gonna open your luggage with this thing. Mm, okay, I don't know. It's not. It's, it's a separate file completely. Right? The file size also is what the difference. Oops, 11 KB. Kind of rough there, but. Okay, but okay, this is cool. How did you find it? Locate openssl.cnf. Okay, openssl.cnf. Okay, 
And does it does it work now? The, the command when you when you change the path? Yeah, I changed the path oh. here. But now it's asking. Yeah, yeah, this should be good then. Who had the issue with Mavericks or whatever? What was it? Yeah, Yosemite. Yosemite, yeah. The same. Yeah, he's got El Capitan, but it seems like the, there's okay. It seems like he's got he's got the solution there. Um, so the command itself pulls up a default configuration in in here. So it pulls up this con and this location seems to have changed from the previous one. So you search for do a, do a term do a terminal thing and just to like locate openSSL.cnf. Uh, okay, I don't know how you did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like, um, hang on. I was just getting, I was just asking for the. Could you help him? <laughs> He's trying to find the the file. He doesn't have the locate thing. Uh, there. He's you got it working? No. No? What happened? No, I, no, I, I, I'm oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> how, how about here? Yeah. HTTPS? Yeah, it was running. So <laughs> it finally ran. Awesome, okay. Yeah. You're skipping ahead frameworks and all that? You can go, go for it. Just reading on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. Sorry, it's just like this is a weird compatibility issues. Fastify is amazing. It's also <laughs> it's, it's really amazing. We went through the performance not yeah, not JS performance in the early oh. morning. Then oh. you're also talking about Fastify. Well, it's it's his project. It's his, so that was the first time we tried it. Now we're using it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I started using it like I don't know uh, last year, like mid, mid last year or whatever when it first came out. I was like fixing bugs all the time and like he's like reviewing my code. <laughs> so it's quite nice. Like I finally get to meet him now. Met you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, Express. I think there's still some issues. Uh, Express like the project is kind of stale and dead, and like there was always they, they do some hacky stuff with the with the the, the way they they wrap the, pro, the, the the request and the response objects that they get from Node in HTTP one, and it doesn't work anymore with HTTP two. It's like some they're like doing things that the internals don't actually they're like not using the official API, and those things all broke. So we're, we've been trying to work with the guy, uh, his name Doug, Doug Doug Wilson, uh, trying to like tell him like trying to fix these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's, he knows, he's aware of those things, but it's just like he doesn't have the time to commit to fixing Express, which is kind of sad because like, there's millions of people using it, right? Yeah. So they can use Express. Yeah. So I, like, personally, I was using Connect for a long time, and now for my new stuff, I always use Fastify. Well, it depends. Like, Connect is like more low level, so high performance stuff, just stick with Connect. Uh, you can use the middlewares, but nothing too fanciful. But then Fastify, you get all this cool stuff for like building APIs, it's just the, the best thing ever. So I put like a bunch of little examples here. Usually I go through it and see like, how I was using schema, how I was doing the fallback and the configuring of like routes and all that. Yeah. It's a really cool tool. Mm. You, it's working on both systems now, right? Yeah. Yes. Good, good, good. How about it? How about here? Is there a can I ask at what point did you get stuck or did you already? Mm, good question. I just sold out some. Oh, place. sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's a bit like. Yeah, it's a big classroom. And it's yeah, it's not your fault. No, 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 it's not about anyone's fault. It's like, I'm curious, like, uh, but you, you do not. You, were you able to, like, run it at all? Like, this is this is Windows, so I'm, I'm also not sure how things go there. I didn't create the certificates. Uh, hmm. So what, what happened for some of them was the same issue. Like they were like on an older version of Mac and it didn't work, right? Yeah. And um, if you if you actually look at the source code of the the, the, the tool, right? Yeah. It's basically just calling OpenSSL on the command line. So if you're able to open install OpenSSL, you can actually use that as well. Just like all all it's doing is like sort of abstracting over it. But it's kind of interesting because like if you ever need this OpenSSL command, you just can't come up with your own fix for it. And I would I would love a pull request for Windows. <laughs> And how's it going? Hi. Uh, it's going pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, I'm a bit out of context. <laughs> uh, here's the I, I tried a push feature. Mm. So uh, it seems quite uh, cool. 
uh, and I tried to falsify it. I didn't. I got the uh, performance uh, uh, boost using falsify, but uh, my colleague uh, he did per performance boost. Yeah, yeah I, I, we did a load test. Ah. With the 10,000 requests, 10 concurrent. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, and, uh, but I had, uh, I had, an, I had about three times the request per second. Oh. Whereas um, this guy, he had a decrease of about 10% or something. What compared to what? Like HP2 versus HP1? Yeah, the TLS uh, core server. Oh, versus, you mean versus just using. Possible. Fastify versus just using HTTPS. Yeah. No, uh, it, it, they were both HTTP2. Okay, both HTTP2. Yeah. And then what versus what? Uh, the uh, no uh, native uh, HTTP2 server. Okay, but Fastify is a framework that's on top of the native HTTP2. Yeah, but isn't it supposed to be we're at the? Um, you did the other workshop, Matthias yeah. thing. I wasn't there, but like I, 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 I kind of use it a lot. Said so. that they broke the protocol in order to make it even faster. So I, I, I guess they excluded some features or something. I'm not sure what he's talking about there, but the way the thing that is really better at is um, they, they have a sort of a JSON generator. There's a, it's like one of the dependencies of Fastify is this like thing that just generates JSON and generates those strings faster than the oh, JSON okay. stringify. And oh, okay, so that's one thing where it, it speeds up. Yeah. And one of the reasons they can do that is because they use the schema that you can supply to pre-calculate, like to pre-generate a function that just statically, like basically you, you create from the schema, create a function that you give it input, it just creates strings of those lengths, right? Yeah. And you avoid a lot of like internal, like allocating, reallocating of string when you concatenate stuff. Yeah. And this is one thing where Node sort of has internally like this concept of, there's two kinds of strings. And when it switches from one to the other, it has to like reallocate all that memory. Yeah. Or when a string grows beyond a certain boundary, it has to grow and like reallocate a bunch of memory. And a couple of times when you're like generating a large JSON ex response, that can really slow things down. And so the way he set it up, it sort of tricks Node into following the correct path straight away, rather than yeah. stumbling until it finds the solution. Right. Yeah. So this is one thing where like he made it faster. Yeah, knew some tricks about the way. Oh yeah, he's all about that. <laughs> yeah, but but. Um, uh, so, but this is streaming, right? Yeah, yeah. This would just be straight like st standard. This is not like high performance or anything like that. This no. is more like showing you can do standard streaming stuff. Yeah. Um, actually, there's a there's a cool API called Respond with File Descriptor. Okay. Uh, if you go to the API documentation, right? Um, this is what I've been using for like serving static content. The node. Uh, and even the Fastify static middleware uses it as well. Oh. Okay. So, this is an API that's only in HTTP2 in Node now, like. It, it lets the ng HTTP to library itself at the C level, like just deal with the file handling. Okay. Um, Node can open a file, file script, and pass it to ng HTTP two, and it'll do it. So they avoid a lot of buffer copying in memory. Okay, so you just pipe a file. It's not even piping. It's not even piping. Like piping, we mean that goes to Node, and Node has to copy buffers around. This is just like, just C library do the thing. Here's a file descriptor, yeah. <laughs> and I think that it is the OS doing it essentially at that point. Yeah. So you avoid a lot of. Like, so if you go for like really high throughput, that's actually what you can do to make it a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. right. But but uh, we had a discussion about this yesterday. C could you sort of like uh, in my project we we have a, a bunch of microservices uh, in a Docker environment. Uh -huh. and then we have uh, Varnish in front. Ah, uh, okay. And we. Have a express server. Okay, okay. And then we have an express server. Yeah, um, right. Uh, At the back there. Yeah. It could you, or would it make any sense if Mornish sort of uh, communicated over HTTP2? It doesn't. As far as I understand, it doesn't actually port HTTP2, right? Yeah, but if it would. With the client, you mean. Uh, the to, browser. The to the browser, okay. And then you can sort of offload. That's, what, that's actually what most CDNs do. Um, then you lose the ability to do push streams, then you lose the ability to do all the yeah. fe HTTP features, but yeah. Then again, you could just upgrade your entire server, right, to HTTP2. Yeah, but if you upgrade the backend and you have a Varnish or Nginx or anything, or any Apache or whatever, proxying, yeah. uh, you, you lose the HTTP side from from the backend because they, they only talk upstream to HTTP one. Yeah. Like yeah, but couldn't you sort of cache all the requests on in the varnish layer and then 
But yes, so, uh, so what, they, what they use for that is the link preload header. Yeah. Uh, most of the CDNs and most of the yeah. these link preload, it's, no, it's, you can do that for a couple of requests, but you can't like push a huge bunch of, like a whole bunch of push, push promises. So I've been actually playing around with that more, like from a front end developer background, I wanted to just like do bundling with the server push, and none of none of the, the none of these uh, link preload solutions would, would would accommodate that because they like they don't compress that header properly. They uh, well, kind of do it on the front end, then, I guess. But um, just like there there be limits on like how many you can do. If, if I push like a thousand little JavaScript and CSS files, which like you know that's a standard front end application these days. It's just that people don't see it because it's in one big webpack bundle. But if you deconstruct it into like its original parts. Then that would actually be like a thousand push promises, and with HP, dude, that's not a problem. The protocol is totally capable of that. It's just that most of the servers kind of choke. Yeah, so you actually don't need caching anymore. I mean, caching is actually now different because you can now cache not just like huge assets; you can cache each of these individual components. Yeah. Uh, so actually, maybe I should talk about that because yeah. I have a section on that. Okay, so. Um, most people have uh, managed to get it working, I hope. Um, sorry about all the compatibility issues with various shells and various operating systems and versions of Mac OS and all that. Uh, but it was a great exercise. I think we got um, So I think probably also, again, a lot of people have skipped ahead to uh, checking out some of these frameworks. Uh, Fastify, many of you were at Mateo's workshop, so you probably know more about it than I do now. Um, Fastify, great framework for working with HTTP2 because it supports it out of the box now. And um, you can use this with your Express middleware. It's fast and all that. Like, there's a whole bunch of marketing hype. Okay, don't use a framework because it says it's fast. Um, use it because, you, because it works and does its job for you, whatever it is. If your job rel relies on you serving JSON output, you know, 10% faster, then just get a bigger server or something. Um, it's like, uh, my, my personal preference for using Fastify is that it's a very nice API. It does the async await stuff. It makes my code more enjoyable to write and to read. <coughs> and that's my primary reason. If I want to make it actually like serve way more requests, uh, I would probably look at very different strategies than just changing a framework and hoping for some silver bullet. But that's just, you know, I don't want to, I, I love Fastify. It's my, by far my favorite choice, and I would use it over Express any day um, because it's just more up to date. Um, but if you want to compare like benchmarks and all that kind of stuff, it's just not really that high of a priority for me personally. Uh, not, not to say that it, it isn't actually the fastest thing, also. Um, so, yeah, I, I put a little example in there that, that shows some of the ways that you use it. But again, you, you guys probably already have gone through that this morning. Um, the only thing that's relevant to HTTP2 is that you basically just set <laughs> HTTP2 true and you're good to go. In the HTTPS options where you provide your crypto stuff, you also just say allow HTTP1 and it does the Alpine negotiating thing automatically. Um, so you've seen all this schema stuff. Basically, for those who were not at that workshop, Fastify has a couple of cool features beyond what like Express is typically capable of. Um, for instance, middlewares. Uh, and, 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 and request handlers can be asynchronous functions um, out of the box. Like if you work, work with Koa or I think Happy maybe, uh, they kind of support these things as well. So it, you, you can normally use a, rec a response object to sort of send output. With Fastify, it's called a reply object, and you have a slightly different API, but it, it's pretty, pretty simple. You just go reply and then send some stuff. And by default, it's really good at doing JSON. It's all set up for JSON. So the incoming request is expecting to be, uh, like if you do a post to a Fastify server without configuration, you should just give it a content type application JSON because this automatically expects JSON. Like it's just really convenient for modern applications. Uh, you don't have to like configure all these things per route anymore. Uh, on the output, you can set things like a schema, like a response schema for like a 200 response. I'm expecting it to have a, to be of type object. It could be type array, it could be type string, whatever. As long as it's valid JSON, you describe it with this JSON schema, which is this spec JSON schema.org. Uh, there's a format that a lot of different projects are using. I use this for other things as well, but like Fastify uses it to describe uh, what is allowed or not allowed in, for instance, this output, this response of a 200. But it can also use it for like tweaking, uh, filtering out the valid versus invalid uh, query string parameters or request payloads and all these kind of things. So it's, it's a really nice, it's a nice to have, it's optional. You don't have to use, set this all up, 
Um, but in this case, I'm using it for a convenience that I can make sure that only the node and the V8 properties are being output because my handler, this is the request handler, right? It, it just returns process.versions and the process.versions actually contains a lot more than just, uh, than just this node and V8 property. It contains a whole bunch of other things, but my output, I'll be guaranteed that it'll only contain node and V8. It has a nice side effect of if you provide schema, it actually makes Fastify faster because it can compile a function that just serializes uh, your object into a string in one shot. Um, but I, it's, it's great in cases where you're, let's say you're using MongoDB, you make a query to your database, you get back some, uh, so, some, 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 uh, some row from your database, and you just output it by doing, like you just return the output. Uh, you actually return the promise to get the output, so you can do this whole thing without, like with, with, with a lot less code, right? You just uh, have an async function that returns your Mongo query, and if you set the schema, it will filter out things like that underscore ID, like these kind of pesky little things that you have to deal with otherwise. All that, all that you know, pointless code, just skip it, just specify what you need to get done, and Fastify takes care of it. So a lot of these nice things I really like about Fastify, so I would use it for that. So, but yeah, and take a look at Fastify. If that's your thing, go for it. Uh, Things like error handling is also taken care of. You can you can set up schemas for your errors and stuff like that. You can you don't even have to actually explicitly send an error. You can just throw an error. So this is the nice way of dealing with async functions. If you have a promise that may may, may throw an error, who cares? It'll just show show a nice error message to the user, and you don't have to write like all these try catches and all this stuff. So really convenient modern code, in 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 in, in with Fastify. Okay, load testing. We kind of covered enough of that. Thanks for killing my server again. Uh, that's okay. You know, mix it stronger next. Time. But but by the time I fix it, coalescing connections. I uh, talked a lot about that. So I wanted to do example. I really did. Um, this is something that has come out like like last week in Node 9.4, and it's been on my to do list for the longest time to actually get this working. It would be amazing. I tried playing with it for a few days, and it, I just couldn't get the API working correctly. It may be a it may be a browser issue that no browser actually supports this right now, but it's, yeah, sorry, I couldn't actually get this example working. But the concept is there, and this will get implemented going forward by all browsers and everyone else. Uh, so a lot of tools can start using this. CDNs will start offering these features. There's more going on than just what's currently supported in Node, which is the alternative service um, frame, which has this origin concept. So the server basically, when, when a client connects to a server to request example.com, it can say, I also serve foo.com and bar.com and send those as origin frames to the client so that the client then knows like, okay, if, uh, if I do a DNS lookup for those domains and they match and the, the certificate that's being used for this connection matches, then I can reuse this HTTP2 session to open streams to various servers on that same session. So that's the concept, um, but this is very new and experimental stuff. So there's still things evolving and people are trying to make it better. Um, for instance, now there's a, um, a lot of discussion in the last few months about secondary certificates. This is a proposal, I think, by people from Akamai or Microsoft or whoever. Um, secondary certificates would be you connect with TLS to a host, right? Um, you get a certificate back, and then the server can send additional certificates. So if you combine that, like if you say, like, this, there's another certificate that comes in for this, this, this extra domain that I want to connect to, um, and the server also declares its origin and supported on it on the thing, then the server can then serve with any certificate later on, like this could be not, not, not just at the initial handshake, but this could be further down when, when the server knows that now you're gonna, now you're gonna make this you know, extra request to a different origin, I'm gonna serve that as well. I'll, additionally, in terms of privacy, this could be quite important. Um, with TLS, there's certain things that are protected and certain things that are not protected, right? So for instance, if you connect to a server, uh, if you connect to uh, you know, my spy server dot whatever, um, People who are snooping on that, your ISP, your you know your your uh, your government agency or whatever, um, they could they, they would see which host you're connecting to. They could not see what's in your request, so they can't see you know the path name of the request because that's already encrypted. Um, if you're able to use secondary certificates, you could connect to you know my generic service and then follow that up with a request to my secret spy server, right? That would improve your privacy because 
you're using, you're, you're, by the time you send that second request, it's already fully, fully encrypted, and you can use those additional certificates, and they would be none the wiser. Anyone who's spying and logging that connection could never, under, could never see what's actually happening beyond that first uh, connection. They only see that first handshake. So if that's to some VPN service or some privacy protection service, then that's all they would see, that you're using such a service, but they would not see what you're actually requesting. Right now, you can actually see that. Unless, like, so right now, we would have to use VPNs for that. This essentially is the, the benefits of a VPN, but in, 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 in standard TLS on every web server and every CDN. So those are some of the concepts that are being moved towards. And like, yeah, I haven't been able to get it fully working yet. So I'll like, rather focus maybe a little bit more of the time we have on server push. Um, so we've seen some of the, fr the frames that were being sent in the low level stuff that we looked at the protocol packets and all that. So those. We saw data frames, we saw header frames, we saw settings frames. Uh, there's another frame called a push promise. It's very similar to a header frame. In fact, it contains almost exactly the same information with a slight tweak. It also declares a, uh, it declares a, a sort of the ID of a stream that it will use, it has the intention to use in the future, hence the promise. So it basically reserves a stream by ID for future use. So the server sends this saying like, okay, stream number 27, I'm gonna use it to send uh, the response to these headers, right? So that's interesting to think about. The response to headers, the headers represent a request. So the server is sending the client a request. That's weird, right? Like, so normally the client sends a request to the server and then the server responds with a, with, with, a, with a response. And each of these have headers and then each of these can have a body, right? Uh, a request can have a body, right? Like if you do a post you have a, or a put or a patch or something. Um, so, but in this case, it's purely originating from the server, sending a request to the client and then sending a response to the client. So the reason for this request being going out from the server is that it has to say, you, it has to tell the client um, enough information about the request so that the client can then determine when, it, when the time comes to actually make such a request, whether or not it matches the promised stream and then it can skip the actual request going out. It can just wait for it to come back. Okay, so it, an example might uh, clarify that a little bit. If, um, if, a, if, a, if a browser supports <coughs> gzip but not brutally, the server might send um, uh, a promise for a brutally encoded uh, um, asset. The client can then say, okay, this response is gonna come, come to me but I can't use it because I don't understand this, this content encoding. So I'm just gonna go and request it anyway. So even though it might be the same URL to the same asset, but a different encoding, it, it could consider that as unsupported and just try to, it'll just reset that, that stream, it'll, it'll cancel that, and it'll make the request anyway. So that's why uh, you might wanna set things in that initial request that's coming in that push promise to have different um, meanings to the client. Right now, though, uh, none of the browsers really uh, care about the headers that you're sending. So there's things like the very header, where you can tell like caches or browsers uh, whether the, a, a, a response from the same path is actually different or not, in which ways it's different, but depending on which headers. Um, right now, that's completely ignored. When you, when you do a push, it's very easy. The browser just looks at the, the, uh, the path name, and if it's the correct path name of the request that it's gonna make, It'll, accept, it'll wait for it. If it's different, it'll make its own request anyway. So it's a very simple, naive implementation, but that will change. Uh, so there's always already been declarations of intent by, I think, Chrome to, to say that we will respect the very header in push promises. But uh, I'm, so I'm not sure if it's currently in Canary or anything like that, uh, but just be aware that that could be a thing. So most of the time, your push promise includes very little. Uh, it's just the path name and maybe a mime type or something, like if you want to do that. But it's very, very bare minimal kind of request, uh, yeah, request that you're sending it in a push, in a push promise. So I'm using this personally for building web apps and sort of bundling JavaScript and CSS and fonts and whatever, so that I don't have to use like client-side bundling tools, like uh, all these build tools like Webpack. Uh, I'd rather not have to use that. I'd rather do that at the protocol level. Uh, one reason is that because it just makes my life easier. I don't have to set up this, you know, I don't have to come up with a Webpack configuration for every little project that I do, right? Um, it also benefits because you can do this even earlier than like a Webpack. A Webpack, if you have a bundle, then okay, you have this wasted round trip still going on because you first have to load that HTML before it can actually even request that bundle. So 
with uh, push, you eliminate that because as soon as you send your index HTML, you can already start sending all your JavaScript and everything. That means that your TCP connection ramps up faster, uh, and you don't have to deal with like specifics of like only the JavaScript and then the CSS. You can also just have JavaScript import other JavaScript import or CSS files import other CSS files import, and not have to wait for a round trip at each stage because it's already being pushed. So I'll show an example of how I'm how I'm doing that. Um, <laughs> This is a quick like, proof of concept kind of exercise here. Uh, I'll just go through it real quick so we can get to maybe something more interesting. Um, right now, we've got Curate Secure Server, which we understand. And then we look at the HTTP version for some reason. OK, what we have to look at is uh, whether or not the client allows push. So if you connect with like curl or nghttp, they they have a setting that, the that they send to the server, the client setting, um, that disallows push. And so if the server were to actually send a push promise, it would be considered a connection uh, protocol error. It will kill the connection. Uh, so you don't want that to happen all the time, right? That's kind of a bad behavior. There could be legitimate reasons why a browser may switch off push. Uh, I don't know of any browser that does that other than the command line testing tools. But so you have to respect that still as to be compliant with the protocol. Um, so you kind of always check and because we're using compatibility layer, there's this whole roundabout way of getting to the remote settings and then figuring out, does it have enable push set to true? So this enable push true, that's ultimately the flag that you're looking for. And when it does, you can use the API that's exposed on the stream instance to send the request headers. So this is the server sending this fake request to the client. And in this case, all I'm sending is a simple path saying, this is my dependency. Okay, and it it receives a push stream. And this is actually sort of the response to the fake request, right? So in terms of the protocol that you see on the wire, this call to push stream here with these headers, this is the push promise um, uh, um, frame. This is the push promise frame that's going out. And until you do something with this push stream object, nothing's going to happen. So you can use this to kind of cleverly sort and rank how you actually emit your information. D typically, what I, what I do and what I think is sort of a, a good practice is you, you receive a request, you, serve, you send all of the push promises, then you respond to the original request with the headers and the data frames, and then you start uh, fulfilling all of those promises with their response headers and their uh, data. The reason is that the earlier you send the response to the original request, that's, that's typically like your HTML, the sooner the browser can start working with that and, and building the DOM and you know, start scaffolding everything out. Um, but you need to send the push promises first, because otherwise, it may still make those requests, because it, hasn't, it doesn't know, it's not aware that they, these, these push promises exist, right? that, you're, that you intend to send that. So it might still send the request out. So send the push promises first, then the response to your main request, and then all the responses to the push promises. That's sort of the, the typical order that I've been playing with, and it works very well. Um, now, in this case, what we're going to see, OK, push web app dependencies. OK, so if we run that, hmm? oh, wrong directory. Where are we at? Six. Ah. <laughs> of course. Um, really? There's nothing here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I've so spun up the exercise as, as as displayed, and I'm going to now. Okay. Okay. So what we see here is two requests: one for slash and one for uh, the fav icon. However, oh, I might not have had this open. OK, hang on. Reset. OK, we see two requests, but we see four requests in here. OK, so what happened? We see four requests from the browser. And ooh, OK, come on. OK, they're served from push. So what it's showing here, protocol H2, in this initiator column, you can tell whether or not it's being served from the push cache or not. 
So effectively, only this cache, uh, this request, this, uh, this, the root in XHTML went out, and our five icon. So the round trips were avoided completely in serving this, you know, demo page. And can prove that by showing that the console indeed logged hello world, which came from a dependency to a script file that was being included. So normally that would be two round trips, and in this case it was zero round trips, like wasted. So that's the proof of concept of like how can you use to bundle an entire JavaScript application <laughs> with zero configuration or build tools. Um, of course, the question is, you know, I don't want to have to code like each of my JavaScript assets into this. So there's tools around that that can be developed. I've been working on some. There's a lot of people who are uh, experimenting with that. Right now, uh, most of what you see in, uh, in terms of public support for push um, is going to be that this link rel preload style. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is most of the CDNs today are built on infrastructure that just doesn't really support HTTP2 in the origin side of it. So there's two sides to a CDN. One is to the clients, to the browsers. So you connect with HTTP2, and you get served a response with HTTP2. But the CDN itself, that edge server, has to make that, that, that proxy request to the actual origin server. And almost none of them, if any, actually do that over HTTP2. They all seem to do this over HTTP1. Um, so it's hard for any of these servers to actually implement true HTTP2 all the way, just because of the, the technology stack that they're on. Secondly, is that from the perspective of a CDN, they're not trying to solve a front-end developer problem. They're trying to solve a network performance problem. And the solution is potentially sufficient. So me as a front-end developer, I see server push as like this amazing solution to make my website faster automatically without configuration and all that. To them, what they're trying to solve is that think time, that server thing, that, that little round trip. And so as long as they can serve a single or maybe a couple of assets, it's fine. The ser so your initial request comes in, and they have that edge cache. They have a couple of files that, that are included in this link preload that they can immediately push. Then they're filling that think time already. And so that network performance issue for them is considered done. But you'd never be able to like push you know, 100 JavaScript files and 100 CSS files, because your, your, letter, your header would just like be crazy long. And most of these servers sort of have a limit on the size of headers. And I, like Cloudflare, I think something like 24 maximum uh, link preload, 25 or something, uh, capped. Uh, they have pretty low limits on these things. So like for, for bundling a whole bunch of assets, it's not ideal. Um, and so this is why one of the problems that I've faced and why I, I prefer to go for something like Node, where you have full HTTP2 in any direction that you want. Like you can easily proxy full HTTP2 from the client to your proxy and from your proxy to the upstream, right? And so that's one issue. Second issue, uh, this is, so second issue, this is an example here, our, our hello world. The second time I, I load this page, right? I make the same two requests and, uh, right, where did it go? The same thing gets pushed, but I could already have this in my cache. I mean, I, I already have this in my cache from the first time I loaded it, but it's still being pushed, so it's being wasted. And HTTP2 has a mechanism where the client can um, sort of reset a pushed stream so to reject it. But it could be that if you're pushing like a whole bunch of files, that just the, just the, just the volume of push promises itself could be you know, kilobytes. And then the resetting each of these individually could be like tens of kilobytes. So you're wasting potentially a lot of bandwidth. Uh, that itself will take round trips. And so this is less than ideal to just rely on the client to cancel it. Also, the, the server might have already, in the meantime, sent it out. If you're like two seconds away, the server could already be like sending a whole bunch of data that your client will eventually just like reject or find useless. And that's, again, wastage. And so to f the solution to this is for the client to, to, to tell the server what it already has in its cache. Uh, it does that. Proposal. This thing is called Cache Digest. That's the proposal. That's If you go to the HTTP working group, you'll see Cache Digest proposal. It's the concept of a bloom filter. Um, I'm not a computer science kind of background guy, but um, I implemented it. And the way I understand it is that you basically look at everything that's in your cache for this domain that you're connected to. You take a hash of it. So you have this nice normalized random like sort of norm noise distribution. And you take the first couple of bits, and you sort of stick them all together, and you pretty much send that to the server. So the server has this list of um, abbreviated hashes of all the things that are in the client's cache. So this takes a lot less 
bandwidth to transmit than just sending all of the URLs, right? So it's just nice and abbreviated. And the server will then just say, OK, I'm trying to push this thing, but I, I can look up in this cache digest whether or not the client already has it by just hashing the URL of the thing that I'm trying to serve, abbreviating it, and seeing if it matches any segment in that Bloom filter. That's roughly how it works, to my understanding. Um, so this is a minimal processing cost in, at the server side and the client side. Um, but it's, it saves the server from doing a lot of uh, wasted uh, round trips. And network performance is way more expensive than CPU performance. Right? It's very, like most CPUs on web servers are just going to be practically idle serving you know, 10 gigabit links. Uh, it's very you know, easy to copy, copy buffers around. So it's kind of nice to have something to throw CPUs at now. Um, but this hasn't been fully implemented yet in any browser uh, on the market right now. It's still experimental. And right now, the proposals are kind sort of switching from Bloom filters to Golem coded sets to Cuckoo filters. And each of them have like some pros and cons. And from my conversations with browser developers, um, there's some difficulties there. Uh, and so some people are still like, OK, why don't we just stick with this link preload? Because it's kind of it kind of maybe solves enough of the problem. Um, but to really, really uh, bundle like large uh, front-end applications with server push, you would need something like a cache digest. And so one of the things I did was to create an uh, experiment with a, um, a service worker that sits in the browser. So your web app has to actually include the service worker. It then hooks into any fetch calls that the, that the browser makes and uses the cache API that the server worker has access to. Um, cache digest. And rather than including it into a, a, an HTTP2 frame, it just sticks it into a header or in a cookie and passes it to the server. Your server processes this. And so this requires a lot more like setup and a lot more infrastructure a little bit, I guess. But it doesn't require browser native support. And it works great. And another way of doing this was to do this on the server. Your server kind of calculates the digest based on what it has previously sent. And this is being used now by this thing that I'm not supposed to like really mention publicly, but it's open and public, so whatever. Uh, there's a project under a certain internet search company that um, is supposed to like give you automatic push support for uh, Fastify and maybe general in general. And um, this basically uses the server to generate the cache digest. The downside to that is that the server doesn't know when something drops from the cache. And that's a big downside. So it, then you might have uh, false negatives or false positives, depending on how you look at it. But basically, it could be not pushing things that are no longer available in the browser's cache. And then this, uh, the client has to make those requests anyway. And so there's, there's downsides to all these things. Until it really gets into the browser, it's always going to be a bit scrappy and you know hacky. But it already solves like a huge amount of the problems that you'd have with bundling huge, like thousands or hundreds or hundreds or thousands of uh, assets. So Cache Digest, it's a really cool solution. And it's sort of an experimental thing. But if you want to set it up, look at the service worker. It's on uh, my NPM and all that. Uh, I've written blog posts and articles about it. It's really good. Um, so yeah, we've got the two strategies. You can either create a manifest for like what do you want to send. Uh, personally, I've been going with this manifest approach mostly. The, the tracking kind of model was uh, introduced by Jetty, like this Java application server, like many years ago, back, back in the SPDY, the speedy days before HTTP2 was standardized. Um, <coughs> so the idea is with, with the automatic tracking thing is that it automatically generates based on a statistical model. When you get a request, you send a couple of responses, and you say, OK, typically I get these responses sent to this request. And after a couple of users, you kind of like get a pattern. And then from then on, maybe like you start using that probability to send out all of those push streams every single time. And you can combine that with a cache digest and get a really good approximation of a, a, you know, a close to perfect uh, automatic push support. Uh, the manifest is basically you use like a, a build tool or a manual, con like a developer can configure this to say, if I'm serving this HTML file, I need this dependency. Uh, and if I'm serving this CSS file, it's including this font and, and, or this image. And so a build tool could build a dependency tree and generate a, a nice manifest that your server or your CDN edge could then use to push the correct assets. Uh, I've built a tool that does that. I've, I haven't built a, the, the, the dependency tracer, but I've built a tool that uses manifests as a concept. Um, and I've found it to be quite effective. When you previously, in the good old days, when we could still load copy.js, it would actually push the various assets. Um, I'll show you how that's actually been set up. 
I don't know where the tab is here. So a very simple configuration that, I, that we did for uh, CopyJS was to say the manifest includes a single rule where the blob, which is sort of like what was being requested, if it matches any HTML file, then you push the favicon and any asset that matched these images, CSS, and JavaScript. So it's a very simple rule that just pretty much pushes all the assets that matter to the HTML page. It's a very simple page also. So you might have uh, more, like, you know, slightly more complex pages. There's a concept of code splitting in like some modern build tools. Um, this is effectively the same thing, but with server push. So you could say, I have an, I have an entry point for index HTML where I need to push these things and I have an entry point for app.html where I push these things. And in this case, the, the, this, this, this website has a landing page that's a very simple, fast-loading web page, and it has a dashboard, which is like a single-page app. And I can put these with two simple rules. I can push all the correct assets automatically. Um, the way this manifest works is not very well documented right now. Uh, sorry, sorry to say, but I'm uh, working on that. And um, this, is, this is one way of basically making server push very usable, rather than having to hard code uh, all of the you know stream dot push and push stream and, and this is a really convenient way and I'm I'm, gonna, I'm going to be exposing this as a middleware that you can use with Fastify or anything else as well. Um, currently, this is available in the entire server project, but the you know the pain point there is that you need to actually use the server. It only does static files, um, and for static hosting, it's great. Uh, boom, boom. For static hosting, it's, it's very convenient but I want to make it more available to like, anyone who can just integrate this into their own web application. I think that would be more useful. This has so far been more of an experiment. Um, so, okay, here, this is basically the exercise. We've kind of like, uh, we've kind of like talked about this now. If you want to do this exercise, feel free to uh, set it all up. The instructions are right there, but let's see. Oh, one, one thing I should point out. This is kind of an annoying gotcha that I, that I thought would save you some time if you encounter it. Um, this is a maybe not so valid HTML page, but regardless, uh, script tag type module. Uh, this is how you can do ES modules in the browser. It works. Uh, cross origin equals use credentials. So uh, if you do not put this use credentials thing, the browser will still make an extra request for the asset. You'll be pushing, the, ser the server will be pushing the asset, the browser still makes an extra request. It's this annoying little thing that you have to do on the initial script tag. Uh, all, the, all the dependencies and everything else doesn't matter anymore once, once the original entry point has that uh, credentials uh, cross-origin attribute. So yeah, because otherwise you, you'll find that this is quite weird to deal with. <coughs> Let me show a little project that actually uses this. This is too, okay, this is too uh, manufactured. So. <coughs> Let me skip over this for now. I'll show you the actual uh, website that uses it. So my goal here was to uh, use server push. <coughs> Can I get a water, please? My, my goal was to use standards as, many, as much as possible. Uh, so I'm using server push for bundling. No build tools that are really doing anything substantial. Thank you very much.
did it. So I've got a fallback uh, for 200 response that just goes to my client-side router. Um, and then my manifest, like I showed before, has an index for the static homepage. And then the app, which is the fallback, if that gets served, then it pushes all of the, the web app's uh, assets, styles, JavaScripts, images, fonts. And, and I can exclude things like source maps. Because when I'm serving the app to a normal browser, like I generate the source maps on the server, so I can, when I open up my inspector, the inspector will load them, but other users never need to, need to download the source map, so it would be wasted bandwidth. So I just exclude them from the server push there. Uh, otherwise, because I'm just using a simple wildcard, it would include them. So I have to explicitly exclude them here. Now, uh, I mean, this is just like a simple uh, single page app. Where's my, okay, my entry point, app.html. And like I said, I have to do this uh, type module cross origin use credentials. So I've got an entry point app.js. What? I said app.js. Okay. Uh, and then from here, I'm just using import. So and this is all like not transpiled. This works in the in the browser today. Uh, I've got a little client side router that I'm that I've simple thing that like like a couple of dozen lines of code that just does some nice uh, routing. Uh, you, but you could use your React routers or what have you. Um, here, I'm so for each of these routes, I'm instantiating a custom element by its tag name. Um, these elements have been defined by their respective component files, which are just JavaScript files that uh, define, like for instance, the login thing that we saw. Uh, where is, so that's coming from authentication login. So. The JavaScript file authentication login uh, is a template element, or extends this template element, which is an element that just like loads some HTML uh, from its own attribute here. And then you start setting up your callbacks, and this is this is your web components custom element sty style of development that that you know I've been working with. So there's no JSX; it's a little bit more verbose. It's all DOM, uh, but it's it works. It's high performance. It works uh, right now. It works very well in Chrome and Safari. Uh, sadly, Firefox is still lagging a little bit on web component support, um, but uh, I know I feel like that will that, just catch up. And I'm building this not for like use right now. I'm not building this for legacy users. I think that my target audience is people who are interested in server push and HTTP/2 are probably people who are using like state-of-the-art stuff anyway. Uh, and if this you know gets adoption in a couple of months from now, chances are that even Firefox will come around and implement these things and ship those things. Uh, I should probably talk to some of the Mozilla people here about that. Uh, but yeah, like uh, my concern was not so much with like full compatibility support, but I was actually amazed that it worked as well as it did. When I started developing this, I was expecting it to be completely broken. And besides a few minor gotchas, like that credentials thing on the script, I, I was amazed that you can today just work with full web components um, with the, the V1 spec. Um, with server push, that just works really well. There's like, it's occasionally you see like weird, behavior when you like command r reload in safari and sometimes it like does a lot of get requests and you don't understand why and there's some issues here and there but like it kind of works and these are just bugs that are going to get fixed by other people so my project will automatically like will will get better for free over time <laughs> right so anyway this is sort of a little project that I want to show if you're interested in like how it works just like it's all open source go through it um I'm happy, happy to talk more about it, but um, yeah, this is the main thing I wanted to show. I wanted to show the the static CDN. I'm, I'm guessing it's down as well, since we nuked my little server. So I've I've I've, I've essentially turned the um, the server project that I have into a, a SaaS, if you will. It's a free platform where you can just deploy static sites. So I, I usually I would I would use GitHub Pages or Surge SH or or Netlify, all these amazing products. I would use those, but none of them really supported HTTP2 server push. And so I wanted to combine those things. So I've built, with Node.js, I've built a, a little SaaS called HTTP2 Live, uh, where you can just deploy a static site with a manifest, and it will just serve it with push. And my prototype has just been one node at, at my house. You know, I've got a nice gigabit connection, and like I'm, I'm, my house is less than a millisecond away from the internet exchange in One North. So it's kind of sufficiently fast compared to an EC2 instance. But effectively, right now, I'm in the process of uh, upgrading all that infrastructure from this proof of concept into a more production capable, actual global distributed CDN with multiple nodes and pops around the world. Um, and it's still a free open source service. It's, I think, one of the only open source CDNs out there. And it's all built on Node.js. Um, 
and I'm having a lot of fun like, actually playing with all this technology and making it possible for other people to host their sites and get all that amazing performance. So um, I hope you all took away some things from here and there. Thanks for bearing with all the compatibility issues and everything that we faced. This is just the nature of doing state-of-the-art stuff. You just spend a lot of time fixing little things, and then you go like, why does this take four hours to find one little, you know, one little missing dependency or whatever? Um, that's just how, it, that's sort of how it is, but it feels really good once you get something working that no one else in the world has done yet. And once you start contributing to, to like Node.js core, like, like a year ago, I wasn't doing any of that Node.js stuff. Uh, I, I only got into it like about, about that time uh, because I saw that like people like Matteo and James and they, they were working on this stuff and I was like trying to just contribute to it. I was just writing some tests for it. You know, I saw like some of the APIs weren't like fully fleshed out yet. And I just started doing little patches, and it was just amazing to see the, how receptive they were to it. And the whole community of, around Node.js core has been really welcoming to these kind of patches. So I highly recommend that if you see any bugs, just go and do a little pull request. You become a contributor to Node. It's a really good feeling to, I just, that your, your, your little fix goes out to millions of people around the world. And millions of servers are running little patches that you submitted. It's a really nice uh, experience to go through that. It's, Anyway, I would say go play with these things and uh, make awesome things. So I think that's pretty much the end of my talk now. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, Thomas. I have just a little confusion oh. for putting all that work into your workshop. Oh. So Thank another you very round much. of applause for India. Is that the most oversubscribed workshop? <laughs> It's the most oversubscribed <coughs> that we had at this conference. Really? really? Yeah, because the room didn't. It wasn't.